Good evening and welcome to tonight's public meeting of the 2019 New York City Charter Revision Commission. I'm Gail Benjamin, the chair of the commission, and I am joined by the following members. Um, the Honorable Sal Albanese, the Honorable Dr. Lilliam Barrios Paoli, the Honorable James Karras, the Honorable Lisette Camillo, the Honorable Eduardo Cordero Sr., the Honorable Stephen Fiella, the Honorable Paula Gavin, the Honorable Allison Hirsch, the Honorable Satish Nuri, and the Honorable Carl Weisbrod. With that, we have a quorum, and we will proceed. Uh, before we begin, I have, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the Commission's meeting on March 14th at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, a copy of which has been provided to all of the Commissioners. Do I hear a motion? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Today we will continue the Commission's series of expert forums on the focus areas we adopted in January. This evening we are privileged to be joined by a distinguished set of panelists put together in consultation with my fellow Commissioners who have generously agreed to speak to us about several governance-related topics. First, we are delighted to be joined by three former public advocates who will be sharing with us their experiences holding that office for almost 20 years, if we add all of you together, and engaging with us on what they believe would be the best way to approach the role of that office moving forward. Um, we, were, we will start with um, now Attorney General Tish. That's it, just Tish. I can't, I'm, I'm blank. <laughs> James. <laughs> um, because uh, Ms. James has uh, agreed to come and speak with us, but has another engagement right after. But she has agreed to answer any other questions or any questions that we ask later on in writing, and we'll be providing copies to all of you of her responses. Ms. James. Madam Chair, it would have been great if we would have had all four former Attorney Generals, but... Public advocates. You did it too. <laughs> Public advocates. <laughs> so my name is Letitia James, and I am the Attorney General for the State of New York. Um, and it's great to be in the company of my former colleagues, or my colleagues in government uh, and friends, uh, uh, the Honorable Mark Green and the Honorable Betsy Gottbaum. Uh, as you know, I served as public advocate for five years, and I want to thank the chair, Chair Benjamin, and the rest of the commission for inviting me here this evening to discuss reforming the governance of the city of New York. As the public advocate as the city of New York, as you know, I was proud to sponsor the bill that set in motion this first ever legislatively created Charter Revision Commission. Um, that was one of my proudest accomplishments as public advocate. And I'm gratified that this body has been every bit as independent and thorough as um, it could be, as, as I could have hoped. Um, the Office of Public Advocate is a special one. It's an important one. Uh, it's the only democratically elected watchdog, which is a, really unique in all the annals of government. Uh, the heart and the role of the public advocate is to ensure that the voices of all New Yorkers are heard, um, particularly when it comes to government entities and agencies that exist to serve them. I've seen all throughout my life how our laws and the government uh, that makes them are not neutral, uh, not monolithic, uh, or unchangeable. Um, in the wrong hands, I have seen that they can oppress and degrade individuals. And in the right hands, I can see how they can, protect, they can protect and lift individuals up. It is therefore a profound thing to have helped lead a new experiment in the eternal struggle for a government uh, that is truly by and for the people. I was proud of the things we accomplished during my time as the fourth ever public advocate and I expect great things from our newly elected public advocate and my friend, Jamani Williams. Uh, Thirty years after the office was first created, I believe two things are abundantly clear. The office has proven its worth many times over, and it is time that the powers be strengthened after three decades of living with half measures. Although there is a great deal an aggressive and creative public advocate can do to tackle systematic problems, it is time to move, move past the warded down compromises of 1989. The office is empowered to demand and agencies are expected to provide any information the public advocate needs to complete an investigation. 
but those demands are not backed up and given any teeth by the power uh, to issue subpoenas. And so it's really critically important that the Office of Attorney be allowed to issue subpoenas. The office is charged with resolving citizens' complaints with city agencies, but the office does not have the explicit statutory capacity or standing to sue on their behalf. We push the envelope as the public advocate, um, and uh, we hope that this body would seriously consider giving the Office of Attorney, uh, the Office of Public Advocate the ability to sue on behalf of New Yorkers. We are allowed to sue in a very, very limited um, capacity, uh, but we really need to uh, um, put in law um, clear um, and exact language with respect to standing. The office exists to serve as an independent check on the mayor, and it's critically important that we have checks and balances. But it is the mayor who sets the budget for the office, and that presents a conflict. It is possible to get information and to resolve complaints with these legal mechanisms um, and with some changes. And I think it is clear that I and my three, my two predecessors who were able to act independently of the mayor despite his control of the budget. But the time has come to put structural underpinnings and strength behind these good intentions. I believe that as we look at the governance of this great city with fresh eyes, we should take this opportunity to finally fulfill the promise of a fully empowered people's watchdog. As a public advocate of the city of New York during my five years in office, I was contacted by jurisdictions all across this nation um, who were fascinated by the office of public advocate and who were interested in creating a public advocate in their jurisdiction. Um, and, and so it's really critically important that we lead by example. And so to me, that requires, again, having subpoena power having the capacity to sue, and having an independent budget beyond the reach of any mayor. And so I thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to continuing to work with you as you move towards a final proposal, which would strengthen the Office of Public Advocate, um, and uh, which would allow it to, con to serve as that check on the office of the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Tish. Um, we will be forwarding to you a set of the questions that are asked of the other members so that you can respond to those questions that uh, may be asked once you leave. If you're staying for a while, that would be great. Um, if you have to leave, you did tell us that your schedule was very tight. Well, well one, I've got to uh, applaud all of you for being very timely, and so I, I uh, did not expect that you would start on time and that you would have a forum. And so I can stay until 6.30. Okay. Thank you. Please don't take this out of my time. I have a question for General James. Did you or any of your staff see the premier show of Billions last night? No, we did not. Um, Paul no, Giamatti is a corrupt former U.S. attorney who is doing everything in his power to become attorney general of the state of New York. And I checked, and it said not based on any living characters. So. But it's well, my understanding that that show is filmed where my office is currently, and it's my understanding that they've reached out to my office, and so yeah. we look forward to having conversations with them. I just want to clear that up. But it's not, uh, again, uh, Take a look. it's really the, show. It's not advocate. patterned after any uh, particular attorney general, as far as I know. Yeah. Public advocate, yeah. got them. Oh. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> well, you're not. Gottbaum comes before Green. Your mic's not on. How quickly you always forget. used to say that I'm older than he is, and therefore I went first. Oh no, it's beauty before age. Thank and you. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Uh, good evening, everybody, and it's very nice to be here with a lot of my old friends and some I haven't seen in a long time. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to talk about the Office of the Public Advocate, and I've given you a long um, sort of treatise on, on what, we, what we've written. But I really just want to emphasize some of the things that, that Tish talked about that I feel are terribly important, and I do, of course, believe that the Public Advocate's Office is one of the most important offices in the city of New York. And one of the things that I feel 
hasn't been emphasized enough in this latest campaign is the, the role of the public advocate as the ombudsman. Because people don't have a lot of places to turn, a lot of places, people in this city, as Tish mentioned, don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. And they can turn to the public advocate's office. And that is such an important thing. And when people say they want to eliminate the office, I say, you don't think it's important that people have a place to go when, I mean, I always tell my wonderful example of a man who lived in a homeless shelter with his two children, and he was denied food stamps, which caused, he called, and for some reason, I, I think I picked up the phone, something I can't resist doing. Um, and, and he said to me that he couldn't, he couldn't complete the application. I looked into it. It was 16 pages long. And it took me almost a year to get that 16-page application down to four pages. I wonder what it's back up to now. But it was helpful to him. He was able to get his food stamps. And to me, when you can help people like that, if it's one person or 500 people or as many people as all three of us, sorry, four of us, I guess, uh, help, that's essential to me. I totally agree with, with, with what Tish said. Uh, it's very important that the office have an independent budget. And I, I suffered quite a bit under that, as some of you may recall. Whenever I uh, criticized a certain mayor, he got pissed off. And uh, he would make sure that my budget got cut. Now, then I would come to the council, and I would beg the council. And generally, the council was very supportive. and and gave some of the money back. But it was this constant dance and constant fight. That's just unnecessary. So I believe that the Public Advocate's Office should have a set budget, and it should be, I, I, I don't even want to say what it should be, but certainly it should have a certain percentage, perhaps, <clears throat> of what the City Council's budget is, but that's for uh, others to decide. There are uh, other issues that I feel very strongly about, but I want to uh, emphasize one other issue to me. Because we are the, the ombudsman of the city of New York and, and have people calling in all the time, you know, we have a great call, we have a great uh, center, 311. Now, it seems to me 311 gets a lot of complaints and it refers complaints out. But the public advocate actually gets a complaint and tries to figure out the solution to the problem. Therefore, it seems to me that 311, the Public Advocate's Office, the Borough President's Offices, and many of the City Council constituent offices should all be united together in, in some way technologically. Needless to say, I have no idea how you do that, but I've been told it can be done. And that, therefore, what would happen um, is that you'd get problem in 311, and that problem would be referred to the public advocate as well as some of the council or some of the borough president constituent problems. And the public advocate could then be the leader in, in solving those problems, which are very clearly a link to the agencies of the city of New York that need to be, that need to give their services a little bit better. So those are really, that's a really very important issue for me, and I was thrilled that the speaker, Corey Johnson, took this up as one of his ideas, um, and I certainly hope that this committee will consider that, um, and in, in your wisdom, you'll be able to figure out how to do it technologically. Anyway, on that, I will stop uh, and turn it over to my friend here. And predecessor. Predecessor, that's right. You are. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for finding me 31 minutes ago wandering into 250 Broadway, <laughs> and then you leashed me and brought me here otherwise, who knows. Um, uh, I'm too old and long married to have profited from speed dating, so I will do my best at speed testimony, which I think I can uh, pull off. I'd like to make uh, three points. First, I'd like to read a quote of a very well-known person, not in this room, about the office. In 1997, this chief executive came to uh, a middle school in Brooklyn um, uh, to speak on Kick Butts Day, a, a project of our then office, my then office. Quote, I don't know if there's another city in America 
that as an elected public advocate, but think about what that means. What would it mean for you to be a public advocate? Someone who is standing up for the people at large, for the public. I'm sort of the country's public advocate, President William Jefferson Clinton. Um, <clears throat> point two. I, I would urge, with all due respect, this panel not waste its time on the every eight-year unserious proposal to eliminate the Office of Public Advocate. Our Board of Estimate was eliminated because it was unconstitutional, said the United States Supreme Court. Short of that, I think it's earned its place in uh, city government. Um, I heard myself. Uh, we hear you better now, and that's always a good thing. Should I start over? No. No. Um, um, I direct you. You know, um, uh, uh, Tish and Betsy and uh, Bill and Corey can comment on how much they, were co they accomplished. But, you know, uh, we proposed, the Public Advocate Office proposed 311. And then Mayor Bloomberg um, uh, capably implemented it. We got tobacco signs and down at the stadium where kids would see them and cigarette vending machines, which would addict 13-year-olds, gone and force the NYPD to disclose. We had standing at that matter under the charter's provision to obtain information. And we forced them to disclose um, how many police officers had substantiated complaints but uh, suffered no uh, penalty as a result. I think the office has shown its importance over the decades, and you should discuss how to strengthen it or not in the time that you have, and given the wide jurisdiction that you have. Point number two is uh, a point that uh, both referred to and Betsy uh, focused on, budget. I will now tell you a story, as they say on television, this is a true story, and my source is Speaker Peter Vallone's Sr.'s memoirs. First city budget. Um, I'm entering office. Rudy Giuliani is entering office. And uh, Peter and the mayor sit down to do the first budget. They finish. And the mayor says, oh, there's one more thing, Peter, that I'd like to d discuss. I'd like to eliminate the budget for the Office of Public Advocate. And the speaker said, what are you talking about, Rudy? I mean, it's in the charter. You can't just eliminate it. He said, yes, we can. And I warn you, I'm quoting Peter's book, someday Mark Green may run against you for mayor and you should get him now. And Speaker Vallone, to his credit, said, you're out of your mind. Forget it. Now, they then negotiated with that starting point of zero that the public advocate office I was entering went from 3.3 million down to 2.7 million. You know, a loss of uh, 600,000 over 3.3 million is a lot. It eventually got back up after eight years to 3.3 uh, million, um, which, and it's about where it is now, I am led to under, uh, understand. So obviously in real dollars, it's, it suffered a significant cut. It is wrong and foolish. Uh, that if an office does its job, it loses its job uh, because the, of a mayor who is politically or personally antagonistic uh, uh, to conclude, I can't, we can't, but you can, come up with a percentage of either the city council budget or the city budget as the independent budget office does successfully and peg um, the budget at a fixed percentage so it keeps up with everything else um, uh, and inflation. Goal that it should now have, not 3.3, .3, given its wide jurisdiction, but at least $6 million uh, to be a monitor over all city agencies and over City Hall. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, are there questions from... 
Commissioner Fiella, then Commissioner Karras, then Commissioner Albanese, then Commissioner Nuri. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me thank uh, the three public advocates for being here, and to Madam Attorney General, congratulations on your historic win, and thank you for uh, uh, one of your legacies from the from public advocate, this body. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll achieve uh, something that will make you proud. Um, this is what Chairman Schwartz and Eric Lane had to say about this position. As with the controller, the commission, the 89 commission, wanted the council president, or public advocate now, uh, to serve as a, quote, watchdog on the mayor on service issues and to propose solutions rather than merely point out inadequacies, inefficiencies, mismanagement, or malfeasance. Each of you have served in the office at different periods in our city's history, but more instructive for tonight's purposes, at different stages of our evolution as a post-89 charter city. So you three have a very unique perspective to offer us. Um, Public Advocate Green sat up there when I sat out there, and uh, I testified out in Staten Island one day with him sitting about two feet from me advocating the abolition of the office. And the public advocate threw his arms up and said, of course, of course. And I said, no, no personal offense, public advocate. A decade later, I was in the Metro Tech Center with public advocate Gottbaum testifying. And what I said to that charter commission was, look, if you're going to keep the office, get it right. All right? Make sure it works. And... Watching this experiment over 30 years and having been part of uh, a charter commission, three charter commissions now myself, no issue other than term limits has consumed or subsumed a charter commission's attention as much as this. I hope we're looking at finding a way to put a lid on it one way or another. My question to each of you relates to your time in that office during that period of that evolution that I spoke about uh, in this, this construct that we have. If there was one threshold item, one key missing ingredient that you think could bring the promise of the office as envisioned by the 89 framers to give it a meaningful voice and a counterweight to, it, to the mayor on service issues, what would that one threshold issue be? Fish. Then so Betsy, then Mark. So, Commissioner, first let me um, um, respond to uh, the testimony of my colleagues. Uh, 311 system is a system of last resort. Um, they have, we track the number of referrals to the Office of Public Advocate when I was the public advocate. And in fact, I use that um, in my negotiations with the mayor of the city of New York for increased resources in the budget. Um, so, so calls are referred to the Office of uh, Public Advocate on a regular basis. In fact, each and every day, most calls are referred to the Office of Public Advocate. Um, two, um, in my tenure, uh, my office handled more than 45,000 complaints. We have passed more laws than all previous public advocates combined. We've issued reports. We were very active in the NICERS board. I sat in that seat where a current public advocate decried that um, the office should be eliminated um, after my election to uh, the Office of Attorney General. Um, I've used litigation and I've pushed the envelope. If I um, could ask for one thing, and that would be the ability or the capacity to initiate litigation so that we could have some strength and some teeth uh, behind our reports and behind our findings. Uh, we were successful in some cases, uh, and the current administration pushed back and challenged our standing, and they were successful in getting, I would argue, um, a bad decision in the um, appellate dis the, um, the Court of Appeals. Uh, and that is why I am so happy to have been elected uh, the Attorney General, because now no one can question my ability to sue. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm gl glad to hear that, that during Tish's tenure that the 
311 connection with the Public Advocate's Office of Courage. It did not happen when I was public advocate. And I, because to me the ombudsman function, as I've said over and over again, is so important, to me the fact that you would not only have 311, which I consider a very good service, but it's also a referral service. And Tish, I would love to hear from you what what were some of the examples of calls that were referred from 311 to you? From my perspective, it would seem to me that you'd get trends and you would get a call, say, from Staten Island, where there was something going on in Staten Island that all of a sudden you hear from uh, the borough president of the Bronx, the same thing's going on there. And then the public advocate could be or would be the entity or the official who would take that information and figure out if it had something to do with the city agency, then go after that city agency in the best way you can. Um, I, frankly, because we didn't have subpoena power or I, I didn't um, bring litigation against any, anybody, um, frankly, the kind of ability, because you're a citywide elected official, to get agency heads to respond was, was very easy. I mean, I found that was one of the things that, was, that worked very well. My understanding is, and maybe Mark can talk to this, that when Mark was public advocate, Giuliani told the commissioners they could not speak to him and they couldn't respond to him. Well, that was absolutely outrageous as far as I'm concerned, but it was not the case in, in, in my case. But I do think figuring out this connection with 311 and all the constituent services of the council, of the borough presidents, figuring some way to combine them and therefore to use that information to make the agencies do what they're supposed to do. That would be the most important thing for me. Um, uh, going back to my original testimony, um, two points. Your question about uh, no issue other than a couple has consumed charter commissions over time more than this one um, exists, improve. I would ask the commission to um, call members of the city council, only you know, 51, certainly the speaker who served in both offices. How many human beings have written them or called them, my top issue, eliminate the office of public advocate? I'm going to make a guess zero in a city of eight plus million over 30 years. Why? Who in the world would want to eliminate an office that's your lawyer? Um, average citizens, of course, can't hire a lawyer or a lobbyist to make a case for them. And the public advocate, like the attorney general, is the uh, uh, people's lawyer. And one other argument to abolish it I find extremely odd. It's sometimes complained of that, oh, it's a platform for people to seek higher office. Now, <laughs> you're going to end up okay here. Al uh, Fiorello LaGuardia and Al Smith were predecessors in the prior office from which this one has uh, descended. Uh, is it a, in, is it descended? Uh, in the line of authority. <clears throat> um, Bill de Blasio becomes mayor. Tish James becomes attorney general. Some others came close. No cigar. <laughs> it is hardly a criticism that if someone rises to this office, number two, next in line in the mayor, and then seeks and wins higher office, I don't know if the city is hurt because LaGuardia, Smith, de Blasio, and James have held a higher office. Um, uh, uh, finally, in terms of one issue, I would go back to the budget, because that's the only thing a mayor could almost unilaterally do. If you had two Giuliani's at the same time seeking to get someone, then it would be a done deal. And uh, it escaped elimination at that uh, moment. I, I, I was prepared with David Boyes to litigate it if he actually did it. Um, fortunately for David's uh, per hour time and uh, my time, it never came to that. But you really have to either eliminate it, which I think is spurious and silly, or strengthen it by giving it more automatic standing than the standing we once earned because we were seeking information under the charter, but to give it a, a more longstanding uh, standing. Thank you. I think you're next, Jim. 
Thank you all for being here. Um, when the this red light is, is on, you're on. Yes. Can everyone hear me? Uh, this is maybe a little a field. Uh, and I see in Betsy's testimony that she talks about giving the public advocate appointments to the BSA, the FCRC, and COIB. Uh, well, and Mark made the statement about the public advocate being the people's lawyer. Do, I know some of the agencies that we're looking at in terms of more independence are other sort of watchdog entities. Uh, COIB, the CCRB, uh, we're talking to the law department next. Uh, and here we have the public advocate's office that is supposed to be in some sense an independent watchdog. We may not have the bandwidth to go there or the time, but is there a role for the public advocate in giving some of these other entities more independence or accountability? I would like to see the Office of a Public Advocate serve on other commissions such as CCRB, Human Rights, and the list goes on. Um, there's other agencies, obviously, that uh, uh, need to uh, include the Office of a Public Advocate. I think that's really critically important, particularly since, one, looking at complaints is a way to establish and identify trends. But, two, um, issuing subpoenas is another way to uh, look at um, problems with certain agencies, but sitting and being appointed to a number of commissions is another way to determine patterns and practices all throughout the city government. Let me also go on to another issue. We've, we're talking a lot about expense um, budget, but we also, the Office of uh, Public Advocate also needs a portion of capital funds. Why do I say that? And I've asked this administration for capital funds for the Office of Public Advocate. The carpet in the Office of Public Advocate hasn't been touched since Mark Green once walked on it. Um, the, ch the, the chairs, the couches, everything, the air quality in the Office of Public Advocate, I believe um, aggravates those who, who suffer from um, respiratory problems. I do know that I, have, I had some staff members who had asthma, and it was because of the air quality in the Office of Public Advocate, because nothing has been touched since the office was created. Whereas you go to other offices in at one center street, they have all been renovated. The Office of Public Advocate has not been renovated at all. And that is fundamentally unfair. And it also, again, it says something about the office and how the city government treats and respects um, the Office of Public Advocate. It is um, a shame. One. Go ahead, Betsy. Um, one, one comment I'd like to make um, is that <clears throat> we have a very, very powerful mayor in this city, and the mayor has a lot of appointments on many of those commissions. I list them in, the, in, in, in my testimony. And I do believe that putting more entities on some of those commissions, like the, um, sorry here, the Board of Standards and Appeals, um, the Franchise and Consent, putting more public officials on those committees would at least get more, um, a better Democracy. balance of interests in, in, on those committees so that the mayor isn't so, so powerful. So forgive me, those of you who represent the mayor. Um, I do feel strongly about that, and therefore I think the public advocate should have a position on those, on those various committees. Not sure about the MTA because I don't know if just one seat on the MTA would, would, would give enough of the balance that's needed. But I do feel the other ones that are mentioned. Well, I also don't think we could uh, change no. the constituency of the MTA. Oh, that's, that's a state law. Hmm. Yeah. Mark? Um, a, a good question and uh, test is, has this office um, added value to the city without it? sine qua non. And of course, on paper, you could say, oh, some other entity, some other ombudsman or oversight entity could have done it. That's a double hypothetical. Did it. And I, I did put into the record in um, lieu of not having testimony, a uh, law review article that I wrote with Laurel Eisner, uh, our then general counsel, 1999 for the New York Law School Law Review, which as of then analyzed the history and the accomplishments of the office, and I, I'd like to submit that for you all to see. And so let me give a specific example. There's 
Um, when I entered that office, among other constituencies, I, we said, let's do something for disadvantaged women, um, which could have come up anywhere else, but a domestic violence uh, survivor came to my office about how she was threatened with being fired um, by a private company because she needed a, a uh, office and a seat far enough away from the door in case her estranged, abusive husband lost his head. And um, we, we organized a coalition with business, labor, and consumers, enacted a law that, you know, un un unless if you're not otherwise protected by union rights, you can fire somebody at will, uh, but it can't be, you know, as we know, for race or gender, or if you're a domestic violence survivor. It became law, and then Governor Patterson made it a state law, and other states picked up on it. Uh, women came to me and said, it's kind of ridiculous that we pay more for the same dry cleaning services and hair cutting services. Now, when I would mention this to men, they'd look at me like, what planet are you on? But of course, if there were two sets of prices on a wall by race or religion, we all know what, you know, what that would be. And so we proposed, and Mayor Giuliani went along with requiring them to post prices so the consumer at point of purchase could say, excuse me, why am I paying uh, more? And finally, women visited the office who were uh, unmoneyed spouses. That's a term of art in the divorce bar where um, the person has no deep pockets and often is outmoneyed in court, often by a male um, uh, spouse in terms of paying for lawyers and uh, protecting their rights to have access to their children. And it became um, a standard. And then the late Judge Judith Kay's Bill of Rights statewide that divorce lawyers had to hand spouses, especially women, a Bill of Rights that they had before they were victimized by the uh, defense bar. And so I use that only as an example. Like, I, I had no idea I, I, I would, this took eight years. It wasn't overnight. I, I couldn't know that. But I think we added value. I think every office added value because the city can't do everything, especially when you have a mayor, any mayor, who is naturally defensive about his, someday her, his appointees. In fact, the office, the idea of ombudsman is a Swedish uh, name that comes from the 1700s when a king didn't trust the people around him and he appointed certain people to report to the king about who was not performing well in his office. And many iterations later, Stan Lundin, then the lieutenant governor, implemented it in upstate New York when he was the mayor of a city there. And Paul O'Dwyer implemented it. He added to the, uh, stat, uh, the structure of the office in the 1970s when he was a city council uh, uh, president. And uh, here we are. It's proven it's worth over 30 years. And until the Supreme Court moves, you know, I, I, I would hope it is strengthened and maintained. Thank you very much. Sal, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening. Uh, I, I must confess that, I, uh, that I've never been able to wrap my arms around the need for this office since 1989 when the Charter first created the Office of Public Advocate. Um, now, I'll give you the reasons why, and then I have a question. Um, we do have a system of checks and balances. We have the mayor. We have the legislature. We have the controller, the chief fiscal officer who audits agencies and, and so on and so forth. And my, my criticism of the office is not about the people that have held it, because I think the people that have held it have done superb, superb job, present company included. And I, I, my belief is you would have done a great job as council members, as, as Letitia James did. And I, if Mark Green was a council member, he would have made the same, the same uh, accomplishments as a council member. I served on that legislative body. And if you're savvy and you know how to use the press, 
Uh, you can get your, you can be, a, you can have the bully pulpit citywide, as you do with public advocate. Um, uh, I served some outstanding legislators. I think of Ruth Messenger, who was my colleague on the city council, who was uh, very, very effective and, and uh, was constantly in the press, constantly promoting issues. Um, so my point is that the, if the three of you were in the city council, you would be as effective as you were when you served as public advocate. Also, the position of ombudsman. I was a legislator. I represented uh, uh, South Brooklyn for 15 years, and the city council had a very effective constituent office, and I was their ombudsman. Then we had the state legislators who were ombudspersons. We had the state, uh, we had the congress member who had a case office. We had the borough president. So the issue of the ombudsperson to me is not that significant because there are so many vehicles for people to reach out. My office was constantly getting calls and we were solving issues. Uh, so uh, the, the one of the sponsors uh, in, in response to Mr. Green, uh, one of the sponsors that it, that's promoting abolishing the city council, the, the public advocate office in the city council, related to me that once he introduced the bill, he received a, a, a lot of calls and emails and tweets about, yeah, why do we need this office? And you mentioned the editorial boards. The editorial boards also raise that issue, not because they're being frivolous, because I think they have the same issue that I have. Why do we need this office? Not the New York Times, obviously. Well, not the New York. Well, I don't know what the New York Times said uh, that they support it, they don't support it. Uh, they support it. The, the, uh, the av when I campaigned around the city, average citizens said continuously, why do we need this office? It's a waste of money, it's a waste of time. Um, what, don't we owe the people of the city an opportunity to weigh in on this issue? Either, as most of you mentioned, the office is really virtually powerless under, under the present circumstances, besides the bully puppet. I mean, it's virtually powerless, let's face it. Uh, why don't we give people the opportunity, since there is, this is the only office where there's this controversy, whether it should be in place or should be abolished, to vote on either strengthening the office, making it a real, a real position with some power, or abolishing it. How do you feel about that? Um, you want to go? Can I, um, we, uh, to use the cliche, we have to agree to disagree. That you, as a I'm extremely skillful, dynamic, well-known person in your district, would come to this conclusion, and that people would come to you agreeing, not scientific. I will go back to survey, as I have not, the 51 members and how many sua sponte say, God, we, we got to do this. Here's the reason. First, you may disagree, but when we all listed things that had been accomplished, the city council with estimable members didn't come up with 311, didn't uh, get uh, the data from the police department on substantiated abuses against uh, police, didn't take down the tobacco signs. And the, in other words, you're hypothesizing it could have happened. It didn't. I don't mean that only the public advocate could have done it, but here's why the public advocate would run circles around an individual council member, which is why so many sought the office. They're not dumb. And the reason is, Jumani Williams apparently thought that he could do more as public advocate than a council member. And the reason is, when you're elected citywide, and you're not, people pull the lever for you citywide, and you become increasingly well known if you do a good job. When you contact the city agency, so long as Giuliani isn't shutting them down, he's busy shutting down other things. Um, uh, uh, you then have the institutional and the public authority to get your call returned and for people to know that you could have access to data, perhaps have standing as the attorney general or urges, and have a fixed budget and are going nowhere. So until you show me a really good argument why all the things that are in this volume and my colleagues here have done, would have, of course, I'm going to throw the burden on you, Sal. Why didn't you all do it? It's not because you're bad people. We, this office with a concentration of talent, citywide, 
each borough and each council member's districts, when they complain, only the citywide person could say, wait a second, look at these 10 council districts and five boroughs all have the same problem, which, of course, a local council member could not. Uh, uh, let's agree to disagree on that. I, 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 let, I never... Let me, let me also say that as, as a council member, if you chair a committee, uh, even if you don't chair a committee, you have budget power. You actually, if a commission does not return a call from a city council member, that commission has got to be, has to be either stupid or uh, I, be terrified of a Giuliani-like mayor. I mean, uh, because you know you're going to be in front of that council. You know they're going to be voting on your budget. So the public advocate can't do anything to a commissioner besides just shame them, and council members can do that as well. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I just don't understand one thing. You know, people have a problem. They don't know where to go. To me, the fact that government can do something to help them on a large scale, as Mark just said, is essential. And look at the size of the budget. It's tiny. It's just tiny. That's not – and it can do such good. I mean, I, I, I could – list all the things which I won't bore you, but there were things that happened that would break your heart because I was able to, I, Tish was able to, Mark was able to really do things that a single council person couldn't do. Count, uh, Ms. Scott, I, I don't yeah. doubt that one bit. I'm talking about the, where, where does this office, what is the essential need for this office in our political system when I maintain that all the things that you, that the public advocate does can be, are done and are probably done with greater leverage because the council has greater leverage than, than, than a public advocate that has no power. Let me just say I, I fundamentally disagree with that position. I'm surprised, the Attorney <laughs> General. But. Most city council members view issues through a local lens and not right. a city lens. Um, right. And one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of this body was to learn the issues in each of the respective districts and connecting with them at the city council hearings were critical. Two, not all city council offices are equal. It's true. I did a study of all city council offices uh, based on the number of calls that we received to the Office of Public Advocate. And when um, a certain council member was advocating for the abolishment of this office, I provided him a copy of the number of calls that came from his district. When he put forth that recommendation, he claims that he received a significant number of calls. I received a significant number of calls basically saying that the office should be strengthened and that um, all four public advocates did a really good job in responding to the needs of New Yorkers. Um, it's also critically important that individuals understand that there are advocacy um, offices within each and within a number of agencies that really should be consolidated and housed in the Office of Public Advocate. ACS has an, has an ombudsman. DOB has an ombudsman. Taxi and Limousine has an ombudsman. We work with a lot of them. And so that's why, as opposed to abolishing an office which has been highly effective, we should strengthen it. During my tenure as the public advocate, uh, we sued on behalf of foster care children. Even though you, have a, you had a committee here, the reality is, is that those issues were not being addressed until we initiated litigation and got a lot of pushback from this administration. We pushed back on behalf of CSIS, and as you know, it's a system within the Department of Education to identify services going to children who were disabled. And the administration just recently threw out CSIS as a result of what we highlighted. Well, the, and the list goes on. Tish, I, 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 am not, I am not debating your effectiveness as a public advocate. And there are some council members that are lemons, and we may get a lemon as a public advocate. The question is, do we need the office uh, within our political system? We know there's a lot, there are a lot of reasons why it was created. One of them, uh, which is not reported, is to keep Andrew Stein, who was the city council president, employed at that time. But, but, but bottom line, bottom line is that uh, the, the, the office, in my opinion, under its present powers, powers is a vestigial structure. Well, and, then I would agree and, with and, you. And let me also point that. And let me also point that. Mr. Green points out why do public officials want to climb to that office? It's pretty easy. I mean, it's great for politicians. Great exposure. You can cherry pick your issues. You don't have to make any tough decisions. And and, and it's it's ideal. 
Uh, and I'm not saying that that happened in your case or Mark's case, but it is, if you look at it from the perspective mm-hmm. of, of uh, a council member, uh, sure, it's, it's certainly it will enhance your visibility. You have a police detail. You get to go around the city. You use the bully puppet. You don't have to vote on the budget. You don't have to take any real responsibility for what goes wrong. It's an ideal political job. The question is, is it ideal for the people of the city of New York? See, I would disagree that it's political, and I would disagree that you don't have to make hard decisions. Because, again, presiding over the city council, oftentimes you are asked if you had a vote how would you vote? And two, you, you serve on the NICERS board, and you've got to make decisions there. And so we led the way on the NICERS board to get guns out of the hands of, of retailers. We led the way on banning fossil fuels in the city of New York. And, it was, and it's not a question of cherry picking. It's a question of identifying patterns and practices that come to your office, either through the 311 system or through the hotline. And that's what's so critically important. And, in, and then issuing reports which have recommendations. And so I would totally and fundamentally disagree with you um, that well, the office should be abolished. But I agree that it should be strengthened. Okay, well, we should give okay, it power. Would you agree that I think we, we either strengthen it or we abolish it? No. No, it's not an either okay. or. Uh, one last point with Mr. Albanese, if I, if I could. You, you and I like each other. Here you're a dog with a bone. And nothing's happened over the decades, and you're not letting up on it. And when you commented just now, you said, oh, I respect everybody. But you do it for the police detail, for publicity. It's easy. I mean, tell me which public advocate you're hypothesizing. Which public advocate has done that? I'd rather not mention any names. I assume. But there aren't that many. (laughs) Um, okay, I think we have um, one, uh, Satish. Yes. Thank you all for staying late, particularly Attorney General James. My day job is to fight bad landlords, and I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned is the 10 worst landlords oh, yeah, list. Was, I think that's a great yeah. service to the people of the city of New York. Um, number two, I'm always nervous when someone says we should kill something. It makes me look extra carefully about what that thing is and why we might need it. And in that vein, I want you to, if you can, I know we're over time, address two points. Number one, the subpoena power. Now, can you distinguish or um, differentiate the role of the public advocate with subpoena power from the subpoena power that the DOI already has? And why do we need that? And, and number two, symbolically as a check on the power of the chief executive. Now, it's easily arguable, and I'm sure uh, Council Member Albanese would make a great argument for this, that the city council is the check on the power of the mayor. Why do we need the public advocate in that role? If you could just elaborate further on those two points. Since we have a mayor, why do we need a public advocate? No. Um, I'm sorry. I since, ma- we I have may have misheard. since we have a city council, oh, city council, as a check on the mayor, what additional check does the public advocate's office serve? Why do we have a GAO? We have a president. We have a Congress. We have agencies. And there are um, uh, independent uh, counsel in each agency to look for wrongdoing. Um, uh, the... Uh, the council that you refer to, by and large, looks for criminality. Not always, but usually. The public advocate office doesn't look for criminality. It looks for patterns of problems that may not rise to the level of a felony uh, or, or a misdemeanor. And so Washington, in effect, actually the public advocate is sort of a New York City GAO um, because it has often come up with things that you may think a, a congressperson or an agency head may come up with, But for reasons of the way we elect members of Congress with gerrymanders and money, and we know it all, uh, uh, you need an independent office with a tradition of independence, not reliant on the mayor, who is naturally defensive. And uh, going back to the question of, oh, these people seek the office because it's a good detail. uh, What was wrong with Tish James, Bill de Blasio, or me, seeking offices of mayor and attorney general. I think, uh, without getting personal, obviously, I think that was a good thing. And, okay. uh, and the reason we were able to do it, it's a citywide office. 
It's elected citywide, and people know it. Thank you, I Mark. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, my, my answer would be when, when uh, an incident I recall, and I'm sure everybody in this room recalls it, when the city council voted to extend to the third term, that was something that the mayor wanted, and there was a lot going on, and the council didn't stop something that, frankly, I thought, um, since the people of the city of New York had voted, I think, twice mm -hmm. not to have that happen, and the council did that. Now, uh, I'm going to go there. What a great example. Mark, <laughs> Mark I think. Um, it was corrupt. Mark, Mark, Mark. Hold on From the beginning, Mark. because Mark. the mayor was able to persuade <laughs> peer billionaires who run the newspapers to do it for him. He was a very important Mark. mayor. And the, but Mark. the public advocate was of a stupid. I'd like not to have this. They were harmless. I mean, they, they didn't do anything. They couldn't do anything. Sal? I mean, that oh, was, that's not wait, fair, Wait, Sal. everybody, wait for a minute. Uh -oh. This was Satish's question, not yours. And Betsy Gottbaum was speaking. You were speaking prior to her, so I'd like to keep the decorum. We've had a very good time with that. So, Betsy, you can finish answering that question, and then I believe that um, Ms. James I defer to, to my... That's uh, a great segue. I voted against uh, the extension of third term. Um, and one, let me just say, we, the Office of a Public Advocate, during my tenure, we turbocharged the worst landlord list. Um, and... Again, a number of city council members were only concerned about landlords in their backyard, and it was really critically important that we establish a citywide approach to bad landlords and bad actors in the city of New York. And I wanted to get information from this administration with respect to whether or not any of those bad landlords were receiving public subsidies. I couldn't, the only way that I could possibly obtain that information was through a subpoena. So it's really critically important that as I establish pattern and practices or, the, or this uh, public advocate establish pattern and practices, that they have the information which is somehow, which is from time to time withheld by this administration. DOI, I worked with DOI on certain cases, but again, they look um, primarily for uh, criminal prosecution um, as opposed to civil. Um, and I think this office should have the ability to initiate civil litigation uh, based on pattern and practice and engage in affirmative litigation that is so critically important. We do not have an office in the city of New York that can engage in affirmative lit litigation to identify patterns in this city. And one of the patterns, again, is focusing on bad actors in the real estate industry. Thank you, Tish. Um, I am the next questioner. And um, I'd like to ask Public Advocate Green um, you proposed legislation in 1994 that would have established a three-member panel of the mayor, the controller, and the chair of the Conflicts of Interest Board to appoint the DOI commissioner rather than appointment solely by the mayor. And it also established the five-year term for a DOI commissioner, which I believe still exists. Can you talk about what inspired that legislation and whether your current view is similar to that legislation or whether over time your position has ameliorated that particular proposal? Uh, I can't recall the thinking that went into it at that time other than the obvious institutional conflict of a mayor potentially appointing a buddy uh, to watch over City Hall corruption and his commissioners. It has not gone unnoticed that a recent DOI pick was A, the treasurer of Bill de Blasio's campaign, and B, ended up very critical of Mayor de Blasio, and C, was fired. I don't know how that real event would uh, contribute to the idea of a little more independence for the DOI head or not. I suspect it would argue for a more tripartite uh, group recommending the person because it, it was not a good idea to appoint the treasurer of your campaign, fine as these two people were, um, because of the obvious inherent conflicts, which uh, ripened in a bad way. Um, Betsy, the same question basically for you, because in your testimony, in your written testimony, in the agencies that you felt that 
the public advocate should be able to have an appointment. You did not mention the conflict of interest board, and I was wondering if that was just not something you had thought about or if you think the roles of the public advocate and the and DOI are that separate? No, I, I, I omitted to say that I do think the public advocate should have a uh, seat on the conflict of interest board, yes, because it's, again, it goes back to that original theme of mine that the mayor is very, very powerful in the city, and this balances the power a little bit better. And DOI? Yeah, I mean, DOI would be the same argument. Yeah, it would be inconsistent if I said no. Tish? Sorry, yeah. uh, public advocate. Jane. <laughs> um, um, ditto. <laughs> I'm going to get this right. Okay, the last person I have with a question for this panel is Sal in the second round. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, uh, clarify uh, one of the uh, assessments that was made about council members only having a local perspective. The, Council members, if they're, if they're any good, have a local perspective, but also have to have a citywide perspective. I certainly, I certainly focused on that as a council member and other, other council members as well. And I, and I point to, to council member Jamani Williams, the new public advocate. I, I think one of the reasons why he did so well in the lieutenant, in the lieutenant governor's race and then wind up winning the public advocate race was because he was considered a very active council member and was constantly in the news around citywide issues, not issues just involving his Flatbush neighborhood. So uh, my point is that uh, good council members, and there are a good number of them, uh, have uh, a local perspective and also should have a citywide perspective. The, the, the average ones or the ones that are below average don't, but that's not a reason to have a public advocate. There's a difference between being an activist and being a legislator. Um, uh, and so I, although I support and I know that um, my friend Jamani Williams will do a great job, um, all the issues that we focused on in the Office of Public Advocate, um, uh, um, I, I, right at this point in time, on the, most of the city council members based upon um, my five years and my work as a former city council member were localized and not citywide. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank the panel for being here and sharing your perspectives and answering our questions. Um, I know that if we or members have additional questions um, that you would be available to answer them. I'd also like to ask Public Advocate Green, he mentioned a report, if he could give us the report and we will copy it and, and send it to each one of the, the commissioners. And if there's any other materials that any of you would like us to, to read or review, if you send them to us, we will copy them and send them to all of the commissioners. I do appreciate your being here, and I appreciate your service and your thoughts. Our next panel... Um, we will be joined by Karen Griffin and Victor Kovner, former Corporation Counsel. Mr. Kovner, the floor is yours. Just on? Yeah, okay. Yes, when the red light is on, you're on. I believe my t testimony has been circulated. I hope it has. Uh, I won't read all of it, but let me begin by saying that my name is Victor Kovner, and I had the honor to serve as Corporation Counsel of the City of New York during the administration of Mayor David N. Dinkins. Uh, who I actually saw today and is in good health, and it's a pleasure to see him. Um, I'm going to comment on the city law department. Uh, in my remarks, I, I do hold it in very high regard. I say in my remarks that it's really a treasure. It's been led by people over the years who have, without exception, run the office in a non-political manner, serving the entire city, which is the heart of my remarks today. 
and um, and it doesn't respond to any particular body in the city, and not the council, not the various other elected officials, and not necessarily the mayor. The mayor has his own council. It's the office of council to the mayor. Uh, and while the law department will advise the mayor, it will advise other entities. Uh, and there are, as you've heard by the, uh, from the illustrious panel just now, there are lots of uh, occasions uh, when uh, various elected officials and agencies will take different positions on issues. Uh, and that's natural and it's healthy. And, and that comes from the fact that they're looking at issues from different perspectives, particularly from if it's an agency, the work of that agency. If it's a particular office, it's the work of that office and their jurisdiction. But outside of the law department, there is no official or agency that has a responsibility for focusing on the interest of the city as a whole, as opposed to one or more of its many parts. And none of the agencies are, are well equipped to evaluate what happens when they take a legal position on one position or an on one issue or another. Only the law department can do that. that you know, when I was corporation counsel, there were 50,000 pending matters at any point in time. And I think that number today, my colleague here uh, may know it, but it's probably 70, 75,000. And the law department has some knowledge of all of those matters, and it has lots of knowledge about past significant issues in court. So when for the city to take a position in a federal court or a state court, appellate court, or a particular judge, there are consequences to that, legal consequences. And the courts, in the first place, are entitled to know the position of the city as a whole and not of a particular official within the city. And only the law department can weigh the consequences as an adverse consequence may be taken because a borough president or a council member has a particular view, but they are unaware of all the other matters in which the city has a stake. So that, and with respect, I differ with some of my old friends who were on the prior panel, the public advocate's office, as, as uh, public advocate Green says, is not the public's lawyer. It's the city law department that is the lawyer. That's the agency that speaks for the city in court. And I think it would be a serious mistake to question the representation of the city in judicial proceedings because it may be dependent upon one particular official or another. And sometimes the, court of, uh, the law department, the corporation council, has the discretion to permit one body or another to appear independently of the law department. And that is principally when there is a question of, very, of differing views of the core powers of that office, where is the council authorized to take a position or the borough president or the city planning commission. And if it's the corporation council's office will permit on occasion those bodies to be represented separately. But the notion, as, and I've got many friends on the, on the city council, that every council member should have the opportunity have to uh, take a position in court um, as, the, as a member of the city council is only going to multiply, confuse the courts as to what the city's interests are, multiply the number of lawyers who, proceed, who appear in proceedings, m multiply litigation for the city of New York, which is complicated and costly enough as it is. So I urge that the, what is set forth in this charter and in prior charters, that the city law department is the sole body authorized to represent the city, be retained, and I would urge that it, I think it's wrong to limit the corporation council to a three-year term or make his or her appointment dependent upon council advice and consent. It would undermine the independence of that office at great cost to the city. Lastly, I'd like to say I'm concerned, having read 
the report of the recommendations of the Commission as a whole that it really — I'm not going to address any particular one, but it does — Let me just correct you. We haven't made any recommendations. Well, then I mischaracterized this Council Revision Commission report. I thought they were recommendations. Uh, that, that was circulated to me, or maybe it is a draft, uh, and maybe they're draft recommendations. And in the draft recommendations, it really calls for changes, uh, it, it, reducing dramatically the power of the mayor, enhancing the power of the council and other agencies. There's a case for, it seems to me, broadening the representation on various bodies, and I think some of those points were made earlier, but this rather sweeping change is — should be done with uh, great caution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kovner. <clears throat> Ms. Griff? You. Your mic's not on. <clears throat> is it on now? Great. Yes. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners, Commission staff, and members of the public. My name is Karen Griffin, and I am the Professional Responsibility and Ethics Counsel for the New York City Law Department. In this role, I counsel and train city attorneys on a wide array of professional responsibility and legal ethics issues. I also chair the Law Department's Committee on Professional Responsibility and Ethics, and I served as a member of the New York City Bar Association's Committee on Professional Ethics from 2011 to 2016. I'm pleased to appear before the Commission to describe the rules and, the, uh, roles and duties of the Corporation Council. Under the Charter, the Corporation Council is the attorney and counsel for the City and every agency thereof, and shall have charge and conduct of all the law business of the city and its agencies in which the city is interested. This means the Corporation Council represents all agencies in the city, as well as the mayor, the city council, and all other city officials. Other than the Corporation, councils, uh, Co Corporation Council and assistant Corporation Councils, no other attorneys are authorized to represent the city in New York in litigation absent a special uh, designation by the Corporation Council. The Corporation Council is the head of the Law Department, which is now has over 920 lawyers and 8,000 support professionals. And while I don't know the actual number, I bet it's over 50,000 matters that are currently pending. Uh, Law Department attorneys give advice to our many clients, and they also represent the city in court. This means we defend the city in a variety of different lawsuits, as well as employees of the city when appropriate. For example, our Labor and Employment Division represents the city in labor disputes and employment actions. Our bank Tax and Bankruptcy Division defends the city real property tax assessments in Article 7 cases and also represents the interests of all city entities and agencies in bankruptcy proceedings in federal court. And our Environmental Law Division addresses some of the most pressing environmental problems facing municipalities today, include, including protecting the nation's largest unfiltered surface drinking water supply, solid waste management, clear air and water issues, and protection of the New York City's harbors, rivers, parkland, and open spaces. Although our Environmental Law Division's work consists of both affirmative and defensive lit uh, litigation on behalf of the City, the Law Department also has an Affirmative Litigation Division, which files lawsuits on behalf of the City's interests. Giving advice and representing the City in court are, are, are our office's primary duties but we additionally review procurement contracts, real estate leases, and financial instruments for the sale of municipal bonds. We represent the city in juvenile delinquency proceedings brought in family court and administrative code enforcement proceedings brought in criminal court. Our legal counsel division frequently works with the administration and the city council on local legislation, and we also work on state legislation that affects the city. The largest division in the law department is the tort division and much of the Law Department's work is defending the City when private individuals and entities sue the City over an alleged harm. In defending the City in such matters, the Law Department, in consultation with affected agencies and entities, and, when appropriate, with the Comptroller's Office, determines which approach best protects the City's interests as a whole. When confronting legal issues, different officials of the City may disagree as to what is the best approach to take. In these situations, attorneys in our office first try to develop a defensible approach that meets the primary goals of the dif different entities and officials. If such an approach is not feasible, then after consultation with the various entities and officials, the office will advance the legally defensible position it believes in good faith will best promote the interests of the city as a whole. 
taken into account the need to maintain consistent and defensible litigation positions on the City's behalf across many litigations. However, if the disagreement is a good faith legal dispute over the powers or duties of an independent official or body, the Law Department will authorize conflict counsel to be retained to represent that official or body. We are counsel to the entire city, including this commission, and we strive faithfully to serve all of our clients. We take our statutory duty to represent the city of New York and our ethical duties to our various clients seriously. Thank you for inviting me to speak on behalf of the Law Department, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, the first person who had their hand up is Jim, and then Carl, and then Paula, Sal, and Steve. Thank you both for being here. Uh, in an article on the legal legacy of Mayor Bloomberg, uh, Professor Richard Brafalt said, a, quote, a particularly striking feature of the Bloomberg administration's approach to home rule uh, is the attempt to blunt home rule by invoking state law and on at least one occasion actually securing a state law to limit the scope of the city's legal authority. Uh, he basically said it was bad enough when uh, the Law Department repeatedly argued that the city was preempted and that the city council was preempted in a number of cases. But then in 2011, they actually backed Bloomberg in giving back decades of city authority over taxicab medallions. How can giving up city regulation of its streets and transportation possibly serve the city in the long run? Oh, I'll presume that's addressed to me, and I'm happy to answer. Uh, but, yes. Uh, uh, the, the sad truth is that state law infringes on the power of our city government to run our own affairs, in, and that power is enormous. And I resented it, and I, I know that other people in, 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 who've held that office have resented it. However, on some of the issues, alas... The, that law is clear. I wish it were. I wish it were different. Uh, some of us have made attempts to limit it from time to time. But if the if the law department in those years advised publicly that the city was unable, unauthorized to take certain actions because of existing state law, I'm ref and I'm not familiar with the exact circumstances. But I believe deeply that that is because that was the law as they saw it and as they truthfully, conscientiously advised their clients. But for four decades, we had taken those actions as a city, and nobody had ever questioned it. We had always issued taxicab medallions as a city, not through Albany doing it for us. Uh, if, unfortunately, that may have been inconsistent with state law, and if when the issue arose and the and the Law Department expressed an opinion. I'm confident that that was their honest and often unhappy uh, information. Jim, would you like to ask Ms. Griffin the same question? Yes, I, I would. So I, I, I don't think my answer is going to differ very much. Um, I wasn't involved in this decision. So, um, But again, I, I know that I, my responsibilities include training every single attorney in the Law Department about their ethical obligations uh, to the various clients. And when the Law Department takes a legal position, it, it, it looks at the position objectively and reaches a conclusion. So I can only assume in that circumstance that perhaps it was the first time the Law Department was asked to look at this, and they looked at it and reached that conclusion. Um, but again, I don't know the specifics, so I can't speak to the specifics. I, I would just, thought, you know, during the Giuliani years, when the Law Department stood next to Giuliani and said that he had the right to uh, stop duly appropriated funds from flowing to the, uh, the Brooklyn Museum because he found their art offensive and no First Amendment expert thought that was the right answer. No, uh, no court ended up thinking that was the right answer. And not only that, but the other public officials. I worked on a brief for Peter Vallone and Mark Green with Laurel Eisler, Eisner, Mark Green's uh, general counsel at the time, opposing that action. So 
I mean, the law department was clearly picking sides in an area where most of the weight of authority went against the position they decided to up- uphold. You know, I wrote an amicus brief on behalf of all the museums or the major museums oh, in this city, taking that I very position. I read your brief while we were working on ours. And, and I agreed with your judgment, obviously. Uh, there were cases on the other side, not persuasive in my view, but I believe that the Law Department, in their presentation, did it conscientiously, even though I deeply disagreed with them. But then whose lawyer were they acting as if the council speaker and the public advocate and all the other officials were on the other side? They were the lawyer for the city as a whole. And like any other lawyer, they are um, capable of uh, error. And uh, you're quite right. The courts, federal courts in that instance, um, uh, took a very contrary position, uh, which we all celebrate. over the years. Can I follow up with one more question? Just or, one. Or, or, Wait, or, can I put you down? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Carl? And then um, Paula? Um, so, first of all, I just want to clarify something, uh, Mr. Covenant, you said at the outset. The, the proposals that you were looking at were proposals from the city council, not draft proposals from this commission, which oh. has had no draft proposals whatsoever yet, and Thank have you. received proposals from many, many sources, um, and I'm sure we'll receive more. Um, and second, I'd just like to say, as someone who's been in, uh, in and around uh, city government for almost half a century, that I've always been tremendously impressed with both the professionalism and the quality of the Law Department, including, I have to say, as a target personally of, um, uh, in one instance of the Giuliani administration, where the Corporation Council did stand up to the mayor and um, and, um, uh, told the mayor, a very personal situation, that uh, the mayor, Mayor Giuliani, couldn't do what Mayor Giuliani wanted to do. I guess my question to both of you is um, um, recognizing that um, the Corporation Council and the Law Department represent the city as a whole, which is a very complicated entity, and does from time to time have within its structure disagreements, that that's not uh, really any different, I suppose, than the state having differences, um, uh, the state, the governor or the state uh, executive branch having differences with uh, various um, independent agencies in the state or with the legislature, or the attorney general of the United States having, uh, representing the executive branch and also um, representing independent agencies and having disagreements uh, internally as well. How does the law department, or if it does, um, differ in its obligations to, it, with respect to those internal, dis- internal disagreements from the way the Attorney General of the State of New York or the Attorney General of the United States has to deal with similar disagreements? I'll give you um, I, I'm not sure I'm equipped to answer this. I'm not completely familiar with how the um, Attorney General, State Attorney General's Office, and, and the state works or the federal system. I know they're similarly structured where um, their legal office is given the power to represent the entity in court. How they work through that on a day to day basis, I, I'm not familiar. I can tell you that the Corporation Counsel's Office and how we operate. Um, we, when we have a matter, and, and because we are the, the law office for the city, we are involved in all of the legal matters um, that occur within the city. Um, and, and when we have an issue, we will often go to our various clients and get their opinion on that particular issue and, and find out where they stand on the litigation. We look to find out how any particular posi- position could affect 
that uh, agency or that entity or that independent, uh, independently elected official, and we consider all of that. And that, you know, we, if we can get everyone to be on the same page, well, that is the, that's ideal. And, and if we can't get them on all, uh, everyone on the same page, we look to find, to, to meet their, their largest demands or their, their, their largest area of concerns. So it's always a process. Ultimately, however, the Charter does give the Corporation Council the authority to make the final decision as to what's in the best interest of the city. I can't answer it in great detail either, but basically it's clear that only the Attorney General of the state appears for the state and the controller never appears and the legislature never appears and the various state commissions rarely, if ever, appear. And if they do, there may be some circumstance. Similarly, in the federal government, the Justice Department is on almost every, is the lawyer for the government in almost every proceeding. And again, they have uh, rare exceptions to that, uh, where a particular agency or when there may be disputes between agencies where a judgment is made that both agencies or, or one or another may be represented by separate counsel, so that the structure here is not significantly different than state or federal, to my knowledge. Thank you. that the Attorney General is elected. In the state. Yes. The, yes. That is true. Paula? Uh, and yes. Then, um, Sal. Uh, thank you both for being here. I wanted to ask you both to comment on the advice and uh, consent um, recommendation that came from um, the City Council for Corporation Council. Do you want me to start? Go ahead. So the Law Department, uh, because that's a policy issue that's ultimately left up to the voters, the Law Department will not take a position on, on that particular policy proposal. I, however, am free to give you my best thinking on it, <laughs> unrestrained by the offices. I think it's a great mistake. Uh, it's, it will, in my judgment, undermine the independence of that, of the law department. It's, it, it is a treasure. It works very well for the city of New York and I urge you not to change its structure. There are some agencies of the City of New York that could do significantly better, and it's, I think it's great that you're taking a look at the overall structure, but I urge you, as to the Law Department, not only if it's not broke, don't fix it, uh, leave it, it's working well. Thank you. Sal? Uh, I, uh, I happen to uh, agree with your assessment that the Corp Council, generally speaking, is professional. It does a great job representing the city. But I think Commissioner Karras raises some legitimate issues about politics raising its ugly head, about independence. Uh, I've seen it over the years um, uh, with different mayors. I served under four uh, different mayors, and I've seen the politics in play. Um, and I think Commissioner Carrick just listed one example during the Giuliani era, but I've seen others, and I don't want to spend time talking about them. My, my question is, since we do, since the City Council uh, does uh, have advice and consent power over the, over the DOI Commissioner, what would be the harm of having advice and consent for such a very important position as the Corp Council. And, and, and also, I also believe that helps the vetting process. During advice and consent, if it's done properly, uh, you can do, uh, you can minimize damage if the person isn't qualified. A lot of stuff comes out during those hearings. So my question is, why, why is that such a big deal? It, um We'll tend, uh, those who are subject to advise and consent uh, are uh, interviewed in advance. Um, I believe that is, happens in the city and in the state and certainly in the federal government. Uh, commitments are sought uh, on particular issues and, and granted. And, uh, the, and the official subject to is sort of constrained. Now, that may be healthy in some circumstances, but it does diminish independence uh, of that officer. Uh, and I, I think that what you have in the law department is, is, a, um, is a history, 
uh, really a tradition of total independence from any particular official. In the time I served there, I know that decisions I made uh, troubled people in, I hope not so often, but on occasion, uh, a variety of people in government, and it, it's, uh, you need to be free to do that to the best of your ability as a lawyer, which is why I urge that that not apply. So, so you think you would have been hampered had you gone through that process? You would have been less independent? Uh, I, I, you know, I watch the hearings, Councilman, as, uh, going on, with the Attorney General who's just gone into hearings, and he's and I'm not unhappy that he's been constrained in a variety of, a variety of areas and as to what he will do in office. Uh, I don't know that that is, that, that those restrictions in effect uh, are, will be impo well, that would be imposed on a corporation council will diminish that independence and I think weaken the independence of the office. Thank you. I think Steve? You're next. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Um, how does the Corporation Council identify potential conflicts of interest in representing various city entities? And once uh, you've identified that a conflict exists, how do you resolve that? Let's say the entity believes Corp Council is conflicted out. How do you resolve that? Is there a formal mechanism of review in place now, or is it more ad hoc as these situations come up? Karen is the best person to answer that. I, I will take that question. Um, so as I said, initially, we do train every single attorney on conflicts and potential conflicts, and they are trained to look out for them. And, and conflicts, you know, it's, it, first let's define what a conflict is. Disagreements are not conflicts. And it is not our, it's not our position in any organization. And, and under the rules of professional conduct, the, any government office is an organization. So 1.13 does apply. And there are always disagreements in organizations. Various arms of organizations want different results, and they're looking out to protect the interest of their particular segment or area. Um, and, and ultimately, that might not be in the best interest of the organization as a whole. So everyone gets to have their say, and they may disagree. But we would not consider that a conflict. That's just a disagreement. However, that's not to say that conflicts don't arise. And, and when conflicts do arise, we are looking for whether a position being taken by one entity, it could be the administration, it could be another uh, independently elected official or body. Um, if they're taking a position that could undermine the duties and powers or authority of another entity, we would consider that to be a conflict. So it could be an actual in that it will, it will, it will definitely affect or could even be a potential. So you're looking for something that would potentially undermine or affect their duty or authority. And in that circumstance, when we identify a conflict, we would independently decide which position we believe is legally correct. We may have already opined on it. Sometimes we have. Uh, other times we haven't yet opined on it. So we take a, a, a fresh look at it. And, and then we make a determination as to what uh, entity or individual the law department will, uh, will represent in that matter. And we will authorize conflict counsel to be retained for the other um, official or entity. So if, if uh, an agency or an official believes you're conflicted out as Corp Counsel and Corp Counsel believes no, Corp Counsel determines whether or not such a conflict exists or is there a mechanism where uh, the official or the entity that's pointing the finger at you guys saying, no, no, you are conflicted out, um, that's when you go to an outside contract? So um, initially, if an agency or entity believes that there is a conflict, they always reach out. They would reach out to me in the first instance, and I would hear them out. I want to know why they believe there's a conflict, what they believe the conflict is, and why they think the office cannot represent them in that matter. 
and then ultimately, sometimes in consultation with Georgia Pastana, sometimes with the, the Corporation Council, we make a determination as to whether or not we believe a conflict exists. So it, it's, it's, we analyze it under the rules of professional conduct, and we make a determination. So ultimately, yes, it is the office that determines whether a conflict exists. And the recourse for the opposing party would be it, it literally goes all the way up the chain so that uh, – the entity has uh, his or her day in court, so to speak. Absolutely. The entity is fully heard on whether or not uh, a conflict exists. Okay. Thank you very much. It may not just be an entity. It may be an individual employee whose conduct may be so bad, so reprehensible, that uh, the the law department decides that that individual um, best be represented by his or her own counsel. That doesn't happen very often, but it, uh, it can happen. So it's, it's, not just it. it's not just agencies. It can be individuals as well. And if I can just add, Mr. Kovner makes a very good point. I mean, conflicts are, you know, when we also represent individual city employees uh, under General Law 50K. So that's another area of conflicts we always have to be alert for. Uh, at, while it's, un, you know, it is uncommon that we will in, uh, encounter the situation described, Oftentimes, city employees are involved in litigation against the city, and we are representing the city adverse to that city employee. We have to be mindful of that if we're going to undertake to represent that city employee in an entirely unrelated litigation. So these are the matters that we're constantly, and and I will say we are vigilant about looking and, and seeking out to see if there's any potential conflicts on the horizon. Thank you. Um, I have a question for either or both of you, do you believe that in the cases where a non-mayoral entity believes there is a conflict um, and or has a position about a matter that is antithetical to what the law department believes is in the best interests of the city, even if it may not be in the best interests of that particular non-mayoral entity. Do you believe your non-mayoral clients feel that they are well represented by you in those cases? So um, I think whether it's non-mayoral or even mayoral, because this comes, I understand well, that I understand your question goes to non-mayoral, but I, I would just point out that it actually comes up in mayoral instances as well, when you have a mayoral agency that does not agree with the position of the law department, um, it's, not, it's not isolated uh, or limited to non-mayoral. But do I believe, I, I think understanding the structure of the charter, what we give them is we absolutely give them the opportunity to be heard. We hear them out. We consider their legal arguments. And the, the, the structure allows us to make, and, and I think it's important to note that the, the law department, because we represent every single entity and, and agency, we have a much more global view. We know and, and consider how any particular position not only could affect this, this matter at, at hand, but also it, how it could play out for, with regard to other entities and individuals. But when so, you get it wrong, let's say in the case of the Brooklyn Museum, what is the recourse that that entity has. In this case, there were other electeds who decided, despite your denying them the ability to have representation, to file briefs. I'm sorry, so what is their recourse? Is that what you asked? No, yeah. I, I don't believe that other electeds filed briefs in that case. I think they were... Oh. Yeah, Jim did. And, and the law department said fine. Uh, that was before... I was... In my notes, I had written down that I'm sure the law department may not even may take the position now that we weren't even allowed to do what we did. Then, but but but, which but was they didn't at the time. Brief. They they didn't object at the time. No, it was. I would have been surprised that it was such a controversial case, such a decision with which I deeply disagreed that I would have been surprised if they objected to a separate submission. At that Although time. today the law department seems that they would reserve the right to stop us from doing that. Well, I think even then, they, the, the fact that they didn't exercise the right doesn't mean that they would say they had no power to stop. It's uh, the other 
there were so many briefs submitted. Um, it, I have to say, it was not the finest moment for the law department. I'm hardly objective on it since I oppose it in that case. <laughs> but what is the remedy in a case such as that? What is the remedy for the agency or entity that still strongly disagrees with the position that the law department is taking? It, it can make record. Uh, there's a case pending as to whether it can put in an amicus brief. The first remedy is to ask to put in an amicus brief. And if denied, they can put in an amicus brief, the officials, not as officials, but as citizens. And, and, and they can participate in other amicus briefs and set forth their views. And I'm sure they can find a way to remind a court that they not only are citizens, but happen to also hold some particular office. Uh, and th that case, uh, which had, as we note, a happy outcome, uh, you know, the court had a, a, a wide variety of views, an uh, enormous number of submissions came in on it. Jim, you're next. Um, how many times has the law department, uh, the, the law department and the council have sued each other. I mean, not the, law, the, the mayor and the council have been in litigation numerous times since I've yes. been in city government, you know, and sometimes the mayor wins, sometimes the council wins. How many times has the law department ditched the mayor and represented the council? So it's my understanding that in, in every instance where the uh, mayor's office, the mayor was adverse to the city council, the law department represented the mayor in those situations, and, and there's, a, there's a history for that, if I can explain just shortly, uh, briefly. I mean, one, mayors work incredibly closely with the law department, as, as I'm sure Victor Kovner will, will uh, attest. So oftentimes we are counseling them, the mayor's office, all along. So whether we're siding with them or the mayor's office has just adopted the law department's legal analysis in the first instance, um, I can't speak to every case because I, I don't. I wasn't involved in them, but I think it's important to know that the, the mayor's office does work closely with the law department. So that guides a lot of what the mayor's office does. Um, and two, there is a history. There's long-established case law for when there's an appointing authority that, when a conflict exists, the the the, the authority um, uh, that the appointed uh, counsel will represent the appointing authority. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it makes sense in the, it, it, for no other purpose than you don't have to hire two separate conflict councils. Um, but so there is longstanding authority on that. It didn't happen yeah. while I was there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a hypothetical question. Uh, a certain borough president is thinking of suing because the administration is not putting its plan for NYCHA infill at Holmes Towers through ULERP. Uh, one of the factors is she has no budget for outside counsel. Should the law department pay or have a separate unit to help with that? So uh, I'm, not, I, I, with all respect, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals, nor will I engage in analysis that, that would, may otherwise be a privileged analysis in a public forum. Okay. And I'm just, this will be it. Couldn't a mayor just decide on his or her own we're taking the borough president out of the Euler process. Nothing will go to the borough president anymore. And borough presidents don't have the money for outside counsel, so they can't sue us. Uh, I have not looked into that issue, nor do I know whether my office has looked into the issue, so I could not opine on whether or not the, the, the mayor has that authority. Well, I'll take a crack at it. The, the, the answer is that goes to the core powers of an, of an other another city official, the borough president in this instance, and the, the tradition uh, and the practice of the law department is to permit and pay for outside counsel for the borough president if, the, uh, if there's a difference in, in, as to view as to the applicable law, because that, that would undermine that official's authority. So, and I don't think there's any occasion in which outside counsel wouldn't be uh, allowed in the, under those circumstances. So if it's pending, I'm, I'm sure that the borough president would be able to get the outside counsel. 
And that is absolutely the current practice of the law department. One last quick question. I'm sorry. Um, uh, there was a case, Mayor v. Council, uh, in the 2007, 8, around there, went up to the Court of Appeals on curtailment. And uh, it was uh, the judge ruled that the may he called it the mayor's theory, was that any uh, local law that lessened the mayor's flexibility uh, was a curtailment. And he, the Court of Appeals shot that down, saying that, you know, sort of taken to its conclusion, uh, that would be unre un an untenable position because the council then couldn't even lower or raise a parking fine because it would limit the mayor's flexibility to issue a ticket of a, a different amount. Uh, but yet, during that whole time, when we were negotiating legislation uh, on all different issues with uh, the administration, we would constantly be told that, you know, what we were trying to do was a curtailment. Who was the law department representing during those legislative negotiations? Were they representing the mayor? Were they representing the council? Were they representing the city? Um, again, I wasn't privy to those or involved in those negotiations, but it is the law department is always representing the city of New York. At the end of the day, that is the law department's client. So the law department looks at a legal issue and, and will reach a conclusion that it believes is the proper legal conclusion in the best interest of the city as a whole. So I can only assume that at that point, that's what the law department that's who the law department was representing. And wouldn't it, I've never in my 25 years of government gotten, you know, had someone from the law department tell me, well, you know, here's the issue, you know, the may, this is the city's position, but here are all the cases on the other side, you know, here's a legal memo for you guys to use, you know. If you're everybody's lawyer, shouldn't you be doing that? So for you guys to use in what context? To support the argument the council is trying to make, that it has the authority to do something. I think it depends on, it, it depends on the context. So if the, the council is coming to the law department and making a asking, is this something that we can do? Do you believe we have the authority to do this? The law department will look into that and reach a conclusion and often provide a memo to the council stating yes or no and giving the basis for that conclusion. Uh, and, and, and presumably, um, in that instance, if that was asked, they were provided that memo. Uh, if the council is saying, but we want a different answer, um, can you please provide us with the strongest argument for a different answer, I think then you're kind of running up against where the, the city charter is saying the law department ultimately gets to make the, you know, when there's different issues, the law department must look at it and say, well, what's in the best interest of the city? What is the most defensible legal position? And what is in the best interest of the city? You know, in... Point, in sorry. I, I just, in 91, the city was facing with an, an unanticipated recession, and we had to make a lot of reductions in, uh, in, bu in budget actions of the council. And there were, in those years, some, a few of you will recall, there were many court orders restricting what the city could do and what the city couldn't do. And we were advising both the council and the mayor. And what we did was summarize a, the, the areas of the, of the budget that could not be modified because to do so would violate a court order. And we made clear that in all other areas, the judgment as to what, how money should be allocated or reduced was entirely the judgment of the council. I don't think the law, law department is sensitive to those restrictions that it got to advise on the law and, and leave the policy judgments to other officials. I think I have the last question. Um, you had said, um, Ms. Griffin, that in issues of conflict between two entities, that in the end, um, if it could not be resolved, you would lean on the side of the appointing authority. 
that that's kind of the established? So if it's, it's, in, if it's a conflict, so if it's something that is a disagreement that goes to the core duties and responsibilities of an mm -hmm. independently elected body or official, um, historically, uh, the, the law department has sided with the administration when it's the administration against city council. And there's case law in support of that, like why that happens, because the appointing, it, it generally the attorney of, uh, is, represents the appointing authority. And if others were appointing authorities? So if, if others there was, were let's say, either advice and consent by the council, would that change the appointing authority? Um, I think would it change? It would add another component, certainly. I think at the, you know, in, in that instance, it would again be um, the law department making a determination as to what's in the city's best interest. And, and, and that may change the equation. I mean, I, I, I don't know. And again, I wasn't involved in the earlier cases, so I don't know what informed the decision then either. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? I'd like to thank both of you for coming today. And thank um, you. You've given us a lot to both think about, and I hope that we can uh, call on you again as we wind down this, this process of looking at the Charter. Thank you very much for thank coming you. Thank you. and for sharing your information with us. The next panel is Stan Brezhnev and Doug Murzio. Muzio. You don't have to bring your coat, Stan. No one's going to take it. Um, why don't you introduce yourselves, and the two of you can decide who'll go first. No, I want to, uh, you go first. Okay. Madam Chair, members of the commission. Your mic's not on. Excuse me? Your mic is not on. It is. It's, it's red? Yes, then you need to pull it closer to you. Madam Chair and members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you. I'm Douglas Musio. I'm a professor of public affairs at the Austin Mark School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College, CUNY. I am a confessed charter revision nerd. <laughs> My affliction began in 1989 when I co-authored the city council report for the 1989 commission, followed in 1992 as a survey researcher for the New York State Charter Commission for Staten Island. It has persisted through the 2003 commission as an expert witness, that was the nonpartisan election, and as a consultant to the 2010 commission. And I've submitted to the commission uh, two reports that I submitted to the 2010 commission. Um, I want to congratulate you all for the obvious thoroughness so far of your efforts and the comprehensiveness of your agenda. I was a strong supporter of this commission because it was more inclusionary of the public and would comprehensively examine the 1989 charter changes in light of challenges and opportunities that have arisen in the past 30 years. My feeling is any meaningful review of today's charter should take cognizance of the 1989 charter changes. What has worked? What has it? Why? How have post-1989 commissions attempted to fix it? Have they been successful? How do we fix it now? 
and, un, and are any unwanted consequences uh, lurking. Uh, a comprehensive charter, in my way of thinking, ought to be framed by three broad themes, centralized power versus local power and advice and consent, governmental checks and balances, essentially how to contain the power of the mayor, expand the power of other city officials and institutions, and an expansion of an informed and efficacious electorate. In my testimony today, I am prepared to uh, discuss matters of governmental structure and process among them, the role of the city council vis-a-vis -vis the mayor through advice and consent and enhanced budgetary power, the public advocate, uh, talk about um, <clears throat> reasons for retaining, eliminating, or enhancing the office, uh, if not eliminating dedicated questions about funding stream and subpoena power. Borough presidents, the same uh, paradigm, retain, eliminate, may, uh, uh, or reduce uh, authority such as land use decision making and capital planning and budgeting. Next, the role of the Corp Council, the Law Department, independent budgeting, and finally, two cautions. I'm under time. Yes, you are. Stan? Stan? Yes. It's all yours. So I have, uh, partly because uh, I learned about uh, this only a few days ago, I haven't prepared any, any testimony, but I, I do want to make some, some general comments. First, by uh, way of how I got here. I think it's worthwhile to see the perspective that I'm bringing to uh, a general set of conclusions about the current uh, uh, current effort, or at least uh, uh, at least concerns. Uh, my first bout in government uh, with uh, issues of uh, separation of powers, decentralization versus centralization. Uh, was in the mid-60s when, uh, uh, as a consequence of the federal war on poverty, uh, an approach to develop uh, a local empowerment within the, within the city was uh, integral to the thinking of how to deliver on anti-poverty programs. And at that point in time, you may recall, there was a heavy emphasis on empowering communities through the creation of structures like community corporations, decentralized school boards, uh, with budgetary authority of various, uh, of various kinds and defined streams uh, of dollars. That thinking evolved into uh, broader uh, uh, strokes, uh, uh, as, it, as it were, and in the city of New York, at that roughly during that same period of time, uh, the evolution of community boards uh, 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 began. And over time, the increased empowerment of, uh, uh, of community, uh, uh, of community uh, uh, boards. Uh, Doug referenced the 1989 charter. I think that that charter revision is seminal and we need to think about the fact that that charter was a consequence of a major court decision that undid the structure of the government that the city had known for a very long time, principally the Board of Estimate and the principle of one person, one, one vote. It called into question the, and ultimately required the dissolution of the uh, of the board of, uh, of of the board of estimate and a rethinking of the third citywide position, the city council president, that became the public uh, advocate, largely for the argument of having a third citywide uh, uh, official. The, the debate I was present at lots of those mm -hmm. debates working for then Mayor, uh, uh, for Mayor Koch, was actually to figure out what 
uh, authority, what responsibilities the, the public advocate or whatever the term would turn out to be who replaced the notion of a city council president, mm-hmm. but always the underlying thought was having a third citywide official and the successor to the, uh, uh, to the mayor. Uh, that was a part of it. And this, uh, an additional thought was a rethinking of the role of the borough presidents. The borough presidents at that point in time, though in more, more restricted form than had uh, uh, been the history of the borough president, some of us in the room, probably just me, uh, old enough to remember when borough presidents had significant budgets, were in charge of the road work and the infrastructure in the uh, in the boroughs. Uh, those were not the halcyon days of old. As, as we think about uh, the consequent centralization of uh, authority that has uh, generally evolved in a straight line in in, uh, in New York City, that thinking reflected a reform approach because of the vulnerabilities, the uh, inefficiencies, uh, the lack of cohesion in city policy and governments that was reflected in the borough presidencies. So all of that was, and more was a part of the thinking that went on under the gun because another court order had said no more board of, uh, no more board of estimate, the pattern of uh, 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 developing government policy, delivering government services. Was that Continue. five minutes? Continue. Oh, oh, okay. I'm more verbose than I thought. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but always, let me cut to the chase here, always the thought that was embodied in the deliberations throughout that particular charter, which was a fundamental charter revision, was how to retain the concept of a strong mayoralty. And uh, in addition to my many years in government, I spent a long time at the Ford Foundation, and I think I have more than a passing view of municipalities around the country. And what separates those that do well, however imperfectly, from those that do not. That those who have learned how to manage and assure their fiscal well-being and those that have not. And generally, the major principle that separates those cities, and in fact, with New York City being the prime example, is a strong mayoralty. Now, I understand that it was reiterated in response to uh, uh, Victor's comments on the earlier panel that there are no recommendations, no particular proposals that have been put forth, but I have read the background material, pages of the background material. And uh, I offer no added value on the particular issues. But I do have a very strong reaction to what I regard as the general tendency in those documents, which is, would result in a reduction, a restriction of the strong mayoralty that New York City has had over these decades. And I think that would be a very great mistake. Thank you very much. Steve, you're the first person who asked. Thank you. Um, We've heard from hundreds of citizens and residents of the city. We've heard from dozens of experts. Uh, But I'll preface my remarks by saying, of all the panels that we've put together as experts, this is the one that I've looked most forward to. Um, Dr. Muzio is probably the single most important source for framing my own thought processes as relates to charter revision in all the years that we've been engaged in this. For me, it's a little more than 20. Your thoughts not only help inform mine, but the approach helped to inform my approach this time around. So I thank you, Dr. Muzio. To the first deputy mayor, 
Um, you're a, a heavyweight, uh, and uh, no, um, you know, I had the privilege of of, of having uh, as a friend a former boss and colleague of yours, Ed Koch, and twice a month for 15 years, Ed Koch and I would have dinner uh, for about five or six hours on a Saturday night. And, uh, you know, when I asked Ed, who was the most spectacular administrator you had in government? Who was the person that you identified as a superstar? He identified you. And that says a lot to me. So I don't think there are two people more equipped that we'll hear from or have heard from that can offer us the right insights. My focus, and just so you know, Mr. First Deputy, um, I refer to us as civic surgeons. Uh, I, I argue that we have a great document in our charter. It's always got room for improvement, but it is fundamentally sound with respect to its structure. This is a very complex political ecosystem that we operate in in this city. And you mess around with one part, and it's amazing the impact it can have on other parts of that ecosystem. But there is one permanent theme that has run through this great experiment since 1898. In 1898, we come together as a city. In 1901, as a result of Brooklyn legislators, they're ready to say enough. The centralization is killing us, right. right? So Albany steps in and enhances the role of the borough presidents. You go another 30 years and it kind of ebbs this way. Another 30 and it ebbs that way. In 89, we've had the most um, uh, substantial reform in our history, but many of us would argue that the underlying tension of centralization versus decentralization continues. Is there anything that either of you envision that a body like this could do to provide for a meaningful voice? Because there are three levels of government in this city, right? Citywide perspective, borough-wide perspective, and local perspective. Dr. Muzio, thanks to you. Um, how could we provide a meaningful voice to the borough executives without disrupting that strong mayoral formula that you referred to? Well, I, I, I think there are a number of ways that, that it, can, and it can be done. Uh, you know, you could enhance the power of the borough president. First of all, the charter changes gave, took away powers from certain bodies and individuals and gave it to others. They strongly, as uh, Stan said, they strongly wanted to preserve a strong mayor form of government. I believe that the borough presidents were weakened to a not inconsiderable extent and a, de and a, and a detrimental extent. I would provide an independent budget for the borough presidents. I would require the appearance of uh, departmental commissioners at monthly interagency meetings, uh, increase the borough president's input and influence in the Euler process. There are ways to give the borough presidents more power in this very complex city. We have a city of 8.6 million people, going to be 9 million people, and we we don't have a government, fortunately, that is simply a top government and a bottom government. We have an intermediate government that can, that can recognize the needs and desires of boroughs and at the same time work within a citywide paradigm. So I think that the borough presidents, even though a, greatly reduced in its power. I remember uh, walking across the hall to the borough presidents and seeing real power exercised by the borough presidents. That doesn't happen anymore. And I think that the, the 1989 charter pushed it too much in the, 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 the direction of weakening the uh, borough president. And this is a supplemental powers. It's not a, a, a revolutionary. It's not going to change the basic strong mayor uh, structure of city government. 
So it's possible to agree both with the thrust of the question and with what uh, uh, Doug has said in a, uh, in a general way. Uh, but uh, this uh, surgical approach to governmental structure is hard stuff. And uh, to be mindful of what's involved here. First, uh, 1989 is a long time ago. Since then, in order to make government work better, uh, there are things like borough commissioners in the parks department. There are community board meetings and aggregate community board meetings where local uh, officials from the important service departments uh, present regularly and interact with those bodies as well as with the, the borough president. So I think the rubber hits the road here in involvement versus power and authority mm. because it is important for city agencies and the elements that go into the delivery of services to be ultimately accountable to the mayor, mm -hmm. to the Office of Management and Budget, to the Office of Operations, and to dilute that or to make it more ambiguous. Uh, a, a quick governance uh, a story. When uh, I came back into government uh, with Ed Koch, and he had uh, initially about 10 different deputy mayors, Carl and Lillian will, will remember that, and I was running at, at an agency at the time, and I was panicked. It seemed to me on the chart I was reporting to three or four different deputy mayors, and in some sense I was. But I had a revelation. Reporting to three or four deputy mayors is reporting to none. Mm -hmm. Reporting to a mayor and a borough president, et cetera, et cetera. So I come back to that one-liner, involvement and engagement, role, but power and authority we must be very careful about. So could I ask then, there's, there have been proposals advanced in years past, and I heard one uh, alluded to earlier, if I'm correct, Professor. Uh, would, in your view, tweaking the charter to mandate the appearance of commissioners to attend monthly meetings with borough presidents, right. would that substantially undermine the no. authority of the mayor, no, or that, is that, that one that, of those? That, that was the point that I was attempting yeah. to make, that these changes would not, all the changes together would not substantially, significantly, or even to a, a, a modicum of extent, impact on the ability of the mayor to determine policy and govern. And finally, uh, uh, several borough presidents over the years have uh, requested the authority to appoint borough commissioners. I assume I would view that as that would usurp the yes. authority of the central Yes, yes. I mean, there, there, okay. there are certain lines or ranges where that would transgress. Thank you for that uh, uh, voluminous material you provided. That's going to prove very helpful. Thank, Thank you both. You. Okay. Uh, Sal, Carl, Allison, and Jim. Uh, Professor Muzio, I, I uh, read through your testimony here, and I see that uh, you share my view that the Public Advocate's Office makes no institutional sense. Um, yes. And, and my question to you is, as I pose to the uh, panel on the public advocate, is would it be fair to, for this commission to consider either providing them with enhanced responsibilities right. or, if we don't, abolish the office? That's, that, that, that is the position of my testimony and the position of the papers that I had presented to the, uh, the commission. And, and is your sense that there's, this, this is the only office in a city that is controversial in nature in terms of whether, whether it should be abolished or not? Well, it, it, it derives from the ambiguity of the position. It was never decided what the purpose of the body was, and it was given very discreet powers, and, it's, and, and in a sense, all the reforms are proposed. It's like random decorations on the Christmas tree. I they like just that. hang there. They're not integrated into a purpose that is coherent, logical, 
and, 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 is, and is adequately funded, in fact. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I have trouble, like you do, get, uh, grasp, getting my mind around yeah. the, the, the office. And I was involved in the discussions of the, uh, the then city council president writing the report for the 88-89 uh, the charter. And it was a highly contentious discussion. I recall. And there was lots of politics. I think you mentioned uh, Andrew Stein. And there How was do we keep Andrew employed? That, uh, I, I would have to say that was uh, uh, an element in the, uh, the decision-making. Uh, one, more, one more question uh, uh, to you, Professor Muzio, regarding the charter itself. Should we codify that on a regular basis, we have a review of the charter. Uh, uh, things change on a regular uh, 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 very fast. We're in 2019 now. Should we put that in a charter instead of just waiting for the mayor to appoint the uh, commission? I don't know. I, it, it doesn't work very well at the state level. I mean, we've had, what, every, every decade or every 20 years, there's a a refer a automatic referendum, and it gets voted down all the time anyway. But this wouldn't I, be a referendum. I, I, this would, we would have, it would be mandating that I, we have. I don't know. I mean, the 1989 charter was, uh, was necessitated by constitutional crisis. The, the voting scheme in the Board of Estimate was unconstitutional. There is no such crisis now. We have the luxury of thinking not in a crisis situation. And at the same time, there, there's a negative to that, that there is no pressing issue or issues that are motivating it. It's, 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 it's a scholarly exercise, I would like to, uh, to think of you people as scholars who are examining the document and offering you know, fixes and, and, and applauding what, what, what has worked well. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. I'll take second round or just? Second round. Okay. Carl? Um, thank you both. And uh, this is, I guess, to you, Stan, because you started with a discussion of how you started in city government in a period in the 1960s when the thrust was more local control, more neighborhood control, and um, and we had a charter at that time where, which r vested control in the borough presidents and in uh, citywide elected officials, and not at the uh, at the local level. And the '89 charter, which I think was sort of boldly. Uh, 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 written with a uh, with, some, with 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 some probably some trepidation about how the new um, newly empowered city council would work. As I think, I don't want to speak for all of my colleagues, but I think there's a general sense that it has, generally speaking, stood the test of time. But as our chair has, from time to time, noted. One major change from 1989 to now is, um, is term limits. And that has, I think, been, been a new dynamic. And you talked about the, the, the need, certainly I share, of a strong mayor system and the balance between the mayor and the council. But there's also a strain of what is the proper balance between the neighborhood and the central, yeah. the central city. And that is, um, I think, because of term limits becoming harder to maintain as a balance. And uh, just in furtherance of uh, the point that uh, Commissioner Fiala raised, is there a role for the borough president, just thinking back on the board of estimate, um, to think more broadly about um, issues facing uh, the city, and particularly in terms of land use, that mm. would lift some of these uh, uh, contentious issues above the more parochial level. So here's where the scalpel that was referred to uh, is, it, uh, it, uh, is required, uh, and I'm not 
I'm not sure which way it needs to uh, 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 it needs to cut. One of the one of the beauties I, I know I'll get laughed out of the room on this of ULERP is its certainty, is the time frames, is the fact at least as uh, uh, initially conceived, there's a start and there's a uh, and there's a finish, and there are assigned roles in the uh, in the decision. Uh, uh, in the decision making because many of us had trepidation because when you're in the centralized government as it uh, as it were I tend not to think in such grand terms for a city but uh, uh, just to uh, uh, describe it uh, there's nothing as important as getting something done getting the job done getting the project moved getting the housing done or the bridge uh, 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 replaced so how to, and, and of course there is a greater good principle embedded in, uh, in that, one hopes, uh, any, uh, anyway. So how to safeguard that, how to assure that things in fact can get done, on the other hand, how to assure that it really does reflect greater good, best interest, the role, the, the uh, engagement of the, uh, of the community, the, uh, the data points that, that come from, uh, uh, from that, those, uh, 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 those sources. Uh, I, I think there is a balance that has emerged in the, uh, in the city of New York, imperfect, because uh, uh, certainly uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty and uh, 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 projects are not always completed timely. They're not always uh, not always completed. On the uh, on the other hand, there are uh, lots of uh, instances of, uh, uh, for uh, uh, lack of a better term, of, of of NIMBY, and lots of instances where the decentralization of authority can turn into the veto power of an individual, an elected official perhaps, uh, or uh, a, 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 a community group. This is a very difficult balancing, a, a, a balancing act. And uh, I would just urge care. And uh, in my long experience, the, the borough presidencies have not always been repositories of uh, uh, statesmanship or uh, 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 the balancing of, uh, uh, of interests. They, they too are in the elected official business. I do not say this about the particular borough presidents. I don't know uh, 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 most of them, but uh, I, I do remember the days when they did have a lot of, uh, a lot of power and uh, stalemates uh, uh, existed. Conflicting uh, uh, policy uh, uh, directions, uh, questions about how resources uh, uh, should be uh, uh, should be allocated, and in truth, most of the time, the issues we're talking about uh, are not impactful only to the neighborhood or the uh, or the borough. Uh, the boroughs are kind of artifices. Uh, I mean, they're they're essentially uh, uh, counties in a uh, in a structure. Uh, so uh, I, I have no quarrel with thoughtfully approaching and deliberating over uh, how to uh, uh, make these things work better, how to enrich the uh, 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 the community, uh, uh, the community involvement, the engagement of uh, 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 of citizenry, uh, but uh, ultimately. Uh, the city has to uh, uh, has to work. It has to grow. It has to be economically uh, viable. Its financial integrity needs to be uh, uh, needs to be assured. Thank you, Allison. Um, thank you both very much for being here. I wanted to actually uh, follow up uh, a little bit on the borough president question and. Um, Professor Muzio, in your testimony, you um, actually suggest giving the borough president greater input and influence in the ULERT process specifically, and I'm curious as to how you would I've, go about I, I that. I don't have any uh, 
panaceas regarding that. I'm just offering that the borough presidents as vital actors in the boroughs and aggregators of opinion in the borough should be incorporated in the process in some way. I am not a ULERP expert. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Jim? Uh, I don't know if you were both here when I asked the law department uh, or the former corporation council and the representative from the law department in all the cases in which the mayor and the council have sued each other. Uh, you know, some of them the council has won, some of them the mayor has won. Uh, you know, how many times did they think it was in the city's interest to take the council's side? And the answer was zero. Uh, what, what do you, do either of you have any suggestions for how some of the, some would say perceived, some would say actual lack of accountability uh, of the law department to uh, other uh, independently elected bodies could be addressed. And I guess I, I want to be clear, you know, I also agree that we have to have a surgical approach to this. You know, I don't think we should have somebody else appoint the corporation council. But and I don't and I think that I want to be clear, the lawyers in the corporation council are great. I've worked with so many of them for so long. And I don't think they give different answers to the mayor than to uh, some for a council member who calls. I do think when there is when there are gray areas and there's a 30 percent uh, argument on one side and a 70 percent argument on the other side, the independently elected official will be told, you know, no, that argument isn't sufficient. You can't do that. And if City Hall pushes hard enough, the 30 percent argument may become a 40 or a 50 percent. I think that's probably how it works. Is, is there a way we can add some more accountability uh, in there? Well, I, the more uh, structural changes is you do away with the mayor's appointment of the uh, corporation uh, council and create a city attorney as other jurisdictions do, like Los Angeles, like San Francisco, so you could solve your problem. It's not surgical. It's a, it's 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 more a, a massive surgery. Uh, it's like in this case, the, well, I, it's not not quite chloroform, uh, and and that that would address the issue because then you would have the city attorney acting in the city's interest defined as all the relevant actors of the city so it, they would have to make hard choices they wouldn't necessarily either explicitly or implicitly prioritize the wishes of the mayor so there is an institutional form that could be a antidote and then if you replace the public advocate you you have the same number of offices so you know it's it's economical as well i thought you were going to ask me the homes question <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no no not to you <laughs> uh inside joke uh so um I have to confess, I'm not as troubled as it, it seems that, that many of you are, and I and I and I understand the uh, the disquiet about the unevenness, the uh, uh, raggedness, as it were, of the relationships, of the way that questions get uh, evolve, emerge, evolve, debated, and so on. Uh, I've run a lot of agencies. I've, in, in uh, deputy mayor, this was true even when I ran the port authority with uh, uh, with two uh, uh, with two governors. There's hurly burly. There's back and forth. Uh, there's no uh, there's no cookbook that's going to uh, ultimately avoid this. No uh, hierarchy in language that's going to. The mayor is the mayor. The governor is the governor. The controller is the uh, is the controller. They, will, they bring big sticks 
to all of these meetings. In my experience, well, I've lost quite a few battles, one recently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's their uh, loss. <laughs> it is their loss. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I know that happens. But it's sort of the nature, the messy nature of, uh, uh, of government. I don't believe it can be completely fixed by any structure because mm -hmm. I can imagine mm -hmm. all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff oh, yeah. with, an independent, uh, with an independent entity. Uh, 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 we see it just institutionally now, not the individuals, but all of us who have uh, been involved in, in government know the back and forth between city controller and, and mayor uh, and the, uh, uh, how that affects contracting, how that affects mm -hmm. auditing of services, uh, how it affects the termination of what's effective and what, what isn't effective. So uh, and you might move the boxes around, restructure something, and there will be a whole new set of ambiguities and uh, and uncertainties. To my mind, even with the hard cases, I'm not a lawyer, but I did listen to the uh, discussion with Victor and uh, I, I didn't know the, uh, the other lawyer. Uh, and to me, uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of those were hard cases. And I've, I've learned, getting instructed by lawyers in all the times that I've been sued, uh, that uh, hard cases make bad law. And I think the, that you struggle through those, you work through them. Uh, the, the, uh, the Speaker of the City Council, the, the Mayor, the, uh, and the odd case gets uh, uh, to a point where it can't, uh, can't be resolved, and then people figure out how they're going mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, the City Council figures out a way to get a, uh, an attorney to take their of their case, or some group of citizens does it. It, it, gets, it. it gets worked out, and I'd be concerned about trying to do something structural that in and of itself will present new uh, issues, not solve very much, because, the, as I say, uh, these, are hard, these are hard cases. Secondly, I, uh, I, want, I want to add something about mayoral agencies, non-mayoral agencies, and so on. Uh, there's no doubt that the leadership of those agencies, even when they're pursuing their cases, and honestly, I speak from very painful, often painful experience, including the recent, uh, the recent example where I'm advocating for, for something, and uh, uh, not all the pieces are coming together as I would like them, and ultimately it ends up with uh, the mayor or in other lives, uh, the governor or the governor of New Jersey, and uh, it gets uh, decided. Well, uh, there are choices if you, can't, if you can't live with it. Somebody has to make the, the judgment. It happens that uh, the mayor is the person in this town who gets elected by the, uh, uh, the majority of the people in the city. So I'm not as troubled as, as you are by the unevenness of some of these things. I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded by uh, Stan that uh, there is much to be admired by practical experience, but I'm an academic, so I deal with structural changes. <laughs> um, I have a question for both of you. Um, I come from the days of the Board of Estimate, and I represented Jay Golden at the Board of Estimate for many years. Um, and I was at HHC after that, so I've kind of followed you around. Um, <laughs> But when the Charter Commission was looking at the responses to the court case and to the invalidation of the voting structure of the Board of Estimate, they could have made other choices. Mm -hmm. But they chose to do away with the Board of Estimate and to try and rebalance that power mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. They tried to elevate the City Council and to give them certain responsibilities, but since the city council was viewed by and large as a weak little sister in those days, um, they, the Charter Commission then also did not want to give too much of the Board of Estimates mm -hmm. responsibilities to the council because they just didn't think the council was up to it. Um, so 
many of the powers that had not been the mayor's previously, that had belonged to the Board of Estimate, were given to the mayor. So looking now, after 30 years and a different council and what Carl said of, you know, what wasn't anticipated was term limits mm -hmm. and that the council would be changing out and would not have the benefit of the old SAGE members who um, — do you still think that balance is the right one, that the amount of mayoral power and prerogative is balanced with a check in the system? That's a box question. It's a, it's a box <laughs> question? Yeah, I think, I think uh, you can enhance the power of the council vis-a-vis -vis the mayor without fundamentally altering the relationship, the strong mayor relationship. It will, it will weaken it, certainly, certain, certain reforms, but I don't think it's going to sh shift the balance where, you know, what was the ugly uh, old hag is now the beautiful young woman. It, you don't have that gestalt switch. So I, I don't think that... Um, I do think that you can make incremental changes, and some of the changes uh, uh, recommended by the council, not all of them, move in that direction. Incremental uh, accretion of power to the council at the expense of the mayor. But it is not, uh, it is not balance altering. It is not, the, the, the balance is still heavily in favor of the uh, mayor, even if all the, all the uh, 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 recommendations were adopted, which isn't going to happen no. and shouldn't happen. Uh, so uh, I would say that actually a lot of uh, change has occurred even mm -hmm in the period of time that I've been absent from government and now that I've returned. Uh, I am struck by uh, how uh, effectively uh, the City Council, through its uh, — uh, with term limits uh, as a limiting factor uh, — uh, how the Council, through its uh, committee structure, mm -hmm. its oversight of the, of the budget, which in almost every respect I would say is superior to what I remember at the City Council, the one exception being a consequence of uh, term limits, where the, uh, the people who led the, the Finance Committee, for example, back in the day, uh, could be in the City Council for years, decades, and became yeah. as conversant with the budget as, uh, as the stewards at, uh, at OMB. So it's hard to do that in uh, two terms, and uh, you do have to rely on uh, on staff, but overall, I would say that the city council has filled some of the oh, yeah. vacuum, oh. uh, and that's, uh, I guess, attributable to the membership, to the leadership of the uh, of the council, the speakers who have uh, uh, had uh, uh, the mantle to uh, uh, to uh, to lead. Again, uh, hard to talk about in the abstract making these kinds of, of changes. It's really important to see in the particular mm -hmm. and to be very, very, uh, uh, very, very careful. Uh, one of the, the — it's a long time ago. Uh, the fiscal crisis was real, though. Mm -hmm. And the credibility of the city, the ability for the city to bounce back, and to demonstrate that it could manage its resources and be trustworthy around revenue projections and expenditures and definitions of capital expenses and so on is in no small measure attributable to the mayoralty. And the burden that the mayor, whoever the mayor is, has to accept for assuring the financial integrity. Now, as I say, and this is not empty, this is uh, my, my genuine view, I have seen the City Council now in, in two recent assignments over approximately two years, for, in the main, embracing that same 
responsibility, uh, care about expenditures, care about effectiveness of, uh, of, of expenditures. So uh, I don't dismiss the possibility that an elected, uh, an elected body can uh, behave responsibly and effectively in this arena, but I think it has to be very well uh, uh, laid out because you do not want a, uh, a delimited mayor to the point where uh, our face, the city's face to the world, uh, as to the integrity of its uh, financial activities is questioned. I agree with uh, uh, Stan on the uh, notion of the dramatic improvement in the quality of the council on many dimensions. I was a chief of staff for a councilman from 1978 to 1980, and it was an era where uh, Henry Stern's dictum uh, writ large that the city council was less than a rubber stamp because at least a rubber stamp left an impression. That is no that, longer the that case. That wasn't Henry, though. And wasn't that, um, what's his name, from Queens with the red hair? No. no Stern. Stern. Okay. Uh, so. <laughs> no, I agree with it, right. it, 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 it has dramatically improved on m many dimensions. I mean, I remember being uh, the chief of staff to a wing of the council that was known as the Liberals. And there were five of us buried at uh, 4951 Chambers Street. And Tom Cute, you know, would send us the budget proposals the day after it was voted on. <laughs> so uh, I know the bad old days. And you're right that incrementally, and, and with the, the, the 1989 charter and subsequent changes, you have a dramatic improvement. But I still think that there are steps that can and should be taken to enhance the council's effectiveness, which, which again, balancing out with the necessity for, which I believe, as you do, in a strong mayor form of government, I think the benefits accrue to the, the city through the council or the citizenry through the council is worth it. Thank you. Sal, you were next. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to echo the words of Professor Muzio. I, I happen to, to agree that, uh, as Stan pointed out, and you've got more institutional memory probably than anybody in the city, Stan, given, <laughs> given all your roles. I lived this long. <laughs> <laughs> that that we, need a, we need a strong mayor, a form of government. I think it's, it's, it's important for the city, but, but – uh, we also need clear lines of authority. So, as you pointed out, with Euler time frame, things get done. We have to move along. But there's no reason why we can't make structural reforms that can make the city even more effective and, and uh, the checks and balances are more effective. And we've seen that, for example, as you pointed out, the hurly-burly of, of government, that, that always is going to take place. It comes down to, to power, you know, the controllers, clout, the, the mayor, the governor. But we've seen changes, for example, to Board of Estimate. I think the 89 Charter, despite the public advocate, was a good thing because a lot of – I was around when the Board of Estimate was around, and there was a lot of – well, some of them were passing paper bags around with money and stuff. Uh, I remember those I days. I never saw those paper bags with but, money. But, but, <laughs> not, not you, Gil. different rooms than yes. I uh, yes, different. But it was, it was, it was cumbersome. It was very cumbersome. Now, yeah, and, and, and I think the, the charter did help in that regard. Also, we saw the same thing happen with the Central Board of Education. Choosing a chancellor was a nightmare until, until that, was, that was changed and evolved into a much better system where the mayor was accountable for appointing the chancellor instead, instead of going through that horrible process over and over again. So there are things like that that we can do, I think, that, that, that can make a difference. I, have, I, I probably know the answer to this question, but I read today – for example, that there are 14 vacancies in the administration, uh, deputy mayors, commissioners, where agencies, you know, agencies need leadership. Is it possible? Or what's, what's your view on imposing a time limit for making appointments, uh, that the mayor has to make an appointment within 90 days? I mean, because I think, I think to have agencies without leadership for months and months and months is not a good thing. Hmm. <laughs> so uh, I don't believe that uh, this mayor or any mayor 
delays in filling uh, uh, significant uh, positions uh, 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 deliberately. And I don't think that uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a standard will advance the, the cause of uh, uh, speedier uh, identification mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. effective uh, leadership. It, and if it's an artificial requirement, then they'll simply appoint somebody and then right. and some, or replace them. I, wa I want to, though, tell you what I think is at work in this kind of, uh, in this kind of environment, uh, having uh, watched government for a long time. There are terrific consequences to term limits. In my view, this it reflects in part a bad consequence of term limits. If you have very difficult positions, challenging positions, posi positions where the outcomes where are uncertain, where success can be uh, elusive, where you need to cast a wide net and perhaps get people uh, to, re uh, to relocate and so on, uh, they're not going to race to uh, work for elected officials, great elected officials, who are only going to be in office for a, a, a year or two. And we all know what happens in administrations since term limits, uh, or when a, an elected official uh, makes it clear they're not mm -hmm. going to, uh, to stay. As the days peter out, people start to leave, and more and more positions are filled from within. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just a, a fact. And I think you're sort of at uh, the cusp here. Okay. Anyone? Gentlemen, I thank you very much, and I hope you'll let us call upon you again and again and again with questions and concerns. And as we move towards proposals, maybe you would be willing to come back. Yeah. Certainly. The chair doesn't let us applaud, but she does let us go like this. Jazz so hands. Thank you. thank you so much. Okay, we are six. Our next forum will be on Thursday, March 21st. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Ryan, I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> Mr. Ryan, would you please? Nice to see you. I'm very sorry, Mr. Ryan. It's okay. Good evening. So, my name is Michael Ryan. I'm the executive director of the Board of Elections in the City of New York. And for those uh, that don't know, the board is an independently uh, established body pursuant to the uh, New York State Constitution. And I answer to a board of 10 commissioners, a bipartisan board of 10 commissioners, uh, one from each party from each borough. Uh, so when it comes to elections, uh, we are a ministerial agency and we follow uh, the rules primarily of the state and to a limited extent uh, the laws that are set forth uh, by New York City. I expect that uh, there will be some questions on ranked choice voting and runoff and such. Uh, so I'll leave that to the question uh, and answer portion uh, so that I can answer your questions uh, specifically. Uh, but I do want to point out something that I think is, uh, and, and the commissioners have indicated, is a glaring inconsistency in the present setup, and we've just experienced it by running the special election on February the 26th. The New York City Charter, as presently constituted, does not square well with the state law vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the operation of elections and special elections in particular. So under the current city charter, if there's a vacancy in a city office for any uh, office other than mayor, the mayor has to issue a proclamation in three, within three days of the vacancy, and a special election has to occur within 45 days. Uh, that gives the Board of Elections really almost no time to prepare for the election. So, under state law, I would encourage this panel to look at 
section 42 of the public officers law and see how some of the considerations that have been given to special elections in the city charter that might not be accommodated uh, in the state law can be dovetailed uh, more neatly uh, so that the city can still do what it wants to do uh, in terms of elections, nonpartisan elections and such, uh, but also meet the time frame that is necessary uh, to accomplish an election event. So presently under state election law, the governor has 70 to 80 days to, to call for a special election, substantially longer than the 45 days for a special here. The primary reason that that 70 to 80 days was put in place was to make sure that we can meet the mandate of mailing out particularly military ballots uh, within 45 days from the date of an election. So clearly, if an election must be called 45 days within 45 days, we can't meet that 45-day requirement to mail to militaries. The other piece of that puzzle is the petitioning process to get on the ballot is set by the state law, and it has its time frames, inclusive of hearings uh, that we have to conduct. In a special election, particularly one leaving the, the other discussions about the public advocate off to the side, uh, the current iteration of the city charter indicates that the public advocate's office is an important one. And so to have that office can be conducted, uh, a special election for that office be conducted within 45 days, not leaving any real meaningful time to challenge uh, an on-the-ballot or off-the-ballot uh, decision made by the Board of Elections uh, through the use of uh, the court uh, challenge process uh, is, a, is a hole in that system. So now we got the Public Advocate's Office special election that occurred. It's now created another uh, vacancy uh, in a city office. And sometime between the certification of this special election tomorrow and the June primary, because of this 45-day uh, rule, we're going to be conducting another special election uh, for the council uh, seat that's been uh, vacated, that will be vacated uh, by uh, council member uh, Jumani uh, Williams, public advocate elect, uh, upon his resignation. Uh, and I, I, under, I think I understand why some of those considerations were made, but I also think in the context of this process, uh, this, this body has the opportunity to make some recommendations uh, to make that more in keeping with the, the state time frames and also uh, marry within that the spirit of why the changes were made in the first place. Uh, so really, I think our guidepost here is uh, Public Officers Law Section 42, uh, which lays that out, and I think uh, the lawyers on this uh, for this committee can look at those two things and, and marry them together in a way that makes uh, more sense for the Board of Elections and the citizens of the City of New York. Um, Steve? Thank you very much. Uh, Director Ryan, thank you for being here and being so patient. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, this uh, subject matter that you raise is actually very interesting. and. Uh, I imagine there are some unintended consequences that would result uh, from, uh, from going forward with it. You know, I don't know what the, the cons are. It seems to me there are a lot of pros right now. But if, if 45 days is insufficient, let me back up here. Is the 45 days insufficient because of the military ballots? Did I hear that right? That's an element of it, That's certainly. Enough. If 45 days is insufficient, is there a... Where's the happy medium? Would you just say just mirror what's in uh, public offices law 42, you know, the 70 or 80 days, or is there a better number, 55 days, 65 days? Well, 62? I think that we like it closer to the 80 days, uh, and I think that when you consider now that after November of 2019, uh, we will be conducting early voting, for every election event from that election moving forward, including uh, absent to change, including special elections. So we're going to look to really push to the end of uh, within our 
within the sounds of our voice. I mean, obviously, there are executives that are elected for a reason, and, and they get to make those decisions within their discretion. But our preference would be uh, pushing that closer to the 80 days to allow for everything that needs to be done to adequately uh, plan for an election, including if the Board of Commissioners is deemed uh, to have made an error in taking somebody off the ballot or, or leaving them on the ballot, or just that one party or another has a disagreement with that decision, there is no opportunity for meaningful litigation in that regard uh, under the 45-day rule as presently constituted. And just uh, follow up the final question I have. Has the board, uh, have the 10 commissioners, um, I don't want to say ruled on this. Are they in unison on this matter? Uh, or, or would it be possible maybe for the board to submit to the commission um, a resolution saying that, you know, we've looked at this, the impediments are such that blah, 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 blah. We recommend that the commission adopt X, Y, and Z accordingly. Certainly I can raise that issue uh, with the board of commissioners. Uh, but I, th I think that I can speak uh, cogently and, and coherently on this particular issue. The more predictability that people have in the conduct of elections, the better off we're all going to be, whether that be candidates. So, so for example, a, a candidate that, that r has run for public office on the state system and now is uh, running in a special uh, on, uh, you know, uh, for a citywide elected office, it would be nice to know that the rules are substantially similar, similar enough that you're not reinventing the wheel uh, every single time uh, there's a, an election being put on. Well, well thank you. I, at first glance, it seems like a common sense uh, uh, course to take. Thank you. Thank you. Satish? Good evening. Could I have be. a 12-part question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and you want, I'm going to take part nine first, and then I'll go to part seven. <laughs> Just really quickly, do you take a position on ranked choice voting? Uh, the board has no official position on, on ranked choice voting. If there's uh, questions regarding the operational concerns, we can certainly uh, have that discussion. Okay. Let's ask, what are the operational <laughs> concerns? Well, presently, ranked choice voting can be conducted using the machines that we that the Board of Elections utilizes. And so keep in mind for those people that don't know, the Board of Elections does not have wide-ranging authority uh, with respect to the voting systems that are used. Presently, there are two vendors that are um, allowed to be used in New York State, and we use one of them. Both of them have similar s systems. You've seen those paper ballots with the ovals. Our vendor uses the paper ballots with the ovals, and so does the other vendor. So any changes that would be made to the firmware or the operating software, if you will, of the election system can only be accomplished through um, action by the New York State Board of Elections. So we can make unilaterally make no changes to the system to accommodate ranked choice voting. So. Assuming no action by the New York State uh, Board of Elections to make uh, such changes to or, or to approve such changes uh, that would, in a contest where ranked choice voting occurred, here's what would happen. Um, and this is 5,000 foot view because all of that depends on how are you going to conduct ranked choice voting. Is it going to be purely ranked choice? Is it going to be weighted? depending on, you know, you get so much of a weight for your first place votes, so much of a weight for your second place votes and third place votes. So all of those decisions would have to be made, uh, you, you know, recommendations by this group and then ultimately uh, amendment to the city charter. But on a very basic level, on election night, if we stuck just with who got the first place votes, and you want to say that, okay, that's going to, first place votes will determine the 40% threshold that could trigger a runoff. If no one gets over that 40% threshold, we don't announce a projected winner in any way, shape, or form on election night. Then we have to wait until the following week where we could first start opening our absentees, militaries, overseas ballots. Then we have to do all of that work, come up with numbers, 
and then external of the voting system plug those numbers into an algorithm that has been determined by the manner in which ranked choice voting is to be conducted. So suddenly, the, it is no longer one person, one vote. It is now one person, one algorithm. And then you'd have to wait for several weeks down the road, not just for us to complete the certification process, but to have any understanding who uh, won or lost without any predictability, in my opinion. And so what, I'm sorry, it was not my turn. Um, Satish, did that address your question? I'll pass it to Commissioner Hirsch, who seems to have a, a good follow-up <laughs> question. If I could read her mind. You can. Very good. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here. So you're, you're saying that absent the State Board of Elections, acting and sort of te and telling the vendors that they have to change the software within the machines there's no way to count on election night a ranked choice vote it depends on how it's going to be administered and unless you're going unless we're going to know what the rules are are you doing top 5 are you doing top 3 so how how is the first place vote differentiated from the second place vote when you're ranking the choice? All of those decisions, I ignored to my detriment uh, algorithms when they discussed them in high school. Uh, but uh, now that I'm in this position as a lawyer, I know enough about them to know that you need to know the rules how the election is going to be conducted before you can craft the algorithm that's going to interpret the data. I, I understand that you need to know the rules. I guess what I am confused by in your assertion is, are there any rules under which, in a ranked choice voting system, you believe that you could count all of the votes on election night? You can count the unofficial votes on election night. But that's true of any election. Correct. Um, but you're talking about a very specific threshold. And I had a little baptism by fire uh, when I first took this job. I came in uh, the 26th of August, 2013, uh, and there was an election three weeks after I took, uh, I, I took over as the executive director. Oh, and by the way, there was a really close call on whether the current mayor uh, reached the 40 percent threshold. So it is a real issue. And we guarded the results of that election jealously until we were sure that we could make an affirmative representation to the city of New York that now Mayor de Blasio was far enough along past that 40 percent threshold that we could state with confidence that he was, in fact, uh, the nominee for the Democratic Party, which in that particular case was de facto uh, the, the mayoral election, as it turned out after the general election. So it's a very important uh, distinction to make, and you don't want to get ahead as a city of that representation because the public confidence, in my opinion, would be undermined. We want to know who the winner is. We want to know who the winner is as quickly as possible. But we don't want to make an assumption that uh, Party A is the, is the victor. Oh, and then two weeks later find out, well, really, Party A now has to be uh, in a runoff, uh, you know, with, with this other individual under present circumstances or under ranked choice circumstances. Oh, well, no, because of the way that we assess weight of second and third place votes, the person that got the most first place votes, which can happen and happened in Maine, is not, in fact, the winner of the primary election, but actually the person who got uh, more second place votes is the winner. All of these are considerations that I'm just raising, uh, and I'm, we're not making a recommendation one way or the other on how um, it, it's going to operate. I'm just saying that these, have, these are considerations that must be taken into account when uh, establishing the ground rules for conducting uh, ranked choice voting. I have many, many follow-up questions, but I will pass so that I don't <laughs> um, start Ed, monopolizing. Did I see your – Ed Cordero – oh, was it Ed or Sal whose hand I saw? We saw mine. 
Sorry, Sal. Yeah, uh, Mr. Ryan, how are you? I'm well, yourself? Oh, good, good. The, the, so are you, there's, there's a possibility there's a, that we, we may endorse rank order voting. Um, right. Possibility, because we are discussing it. So are you guys at the board doing any stress testing on, on, on figuring this out, what the different, different options and how to, how to expedite the process? Are you, are you drilling uh, down on this stuff? The, the, the stress testing really isn't, isn't so much of an issue for us because we've uh, stress tested our election night results uh, process well past what we would ever expect for, uh, uh, you know, for uh, the number of voters that would, that would show up. Uh, but we have had conversations uh, with our vendor about what could be done. And what I was told is al already what, I, what I've told you folks is until we know what the rules are and what the expectation is, the algorithm can't be, uh, can't be determined. So once it is, once we do know what the rules are, then there are those uh, mathematicians much smarter than I that can establish an algorithm, and we can put that to the election night results. Are you, are you discussing this with any other jurisdictions? For example, we had folks here from, uh, uh, I think it was South Carolina, or, or, or right, and I f was it South Carolina? Austin. Austin, we had Austin, Austin. and South Carolina. Uh, those folks have implemented it. Are you talking to them? Um, I've spoken to a Midwest, uh, and I'll, it was a private conversation, and, and, and I got some. So maybe we could put you. We could some put you sound advice, but um, I, I think the administrators that are in jurisdictions that operate ranked choice voting are constrained in what they will say publicly with respect to the ranked choice voting. Well, they, I mean, unless they perjured themselves here, uh, the, 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 the folks from, uh, a guy from Austin and the woman from South Carolina were very enthusiastic about it, Mr. Ryan. Uh, I don't, I, I don't, I don't doubt their enthusiasm, uh, but I also know that they have a structure within which they work and a position uh, that they have to take based on that, based on that structure. I, I'm not trying to be the cold... A glass of water. What, what I'm simply saying is there are limits to what we can do to make adjustments to the election system that we presently utilize. And until such time as an entity other than the Board of Elections of the City of New York, i.e. the New York State Board of Elections, knows what changes need to be made, goes through the change process, which typically takes 8 to 12 months, by the time they make all of the changes and then have it audited by an outside uh, entity, the interim plan would be to conduct the election exactly the way that we conduct it and to use an external algorithm that would have to be a program that we run <laughs> separate and apart from the elections machine. So it would no longer be the elections machines tallying the votes and telling us what the results are. We'd have to tally the votes, then take those votes, pass them through the algorithm, and then uh, give the ultimate results. It, it bifurcates the process well, is the best way that I could say uh, it. You know your business. I don't mean to tell you your business, but I, I would recommend you reach out to these folks and have some preliminary, preliminary discussions because you know, they, they've already done it for a number of elections. So. Carl, you're next, and then Allison again. So, I'm sorry, I, I think I'm a little confused. Um, just to be clear, it, did you say that the, the s system we have now um, could, with adjustments, handle ranked choice voting with enough lead time <coughs> to readjust the current the current system is that that is my understanding that the algorithm could be with proper programming baked into the cake so to speak so if and if, if I'm wrong about that I, I will double check that and I'll get back to this committee immediately but that's my understanding so so we have gotten pretty much across the board 
um, testimony here from, as my colleagues have indicated, from a number of different places um, that rank choice voting, whatever its positives and negatives, as a mechanical matter, has worked fine, and that voters uh, seem to understand it. And um, as far as we know, at least from major uh, places that have implemented it, it has mechanically worked fine. Um, do you, are you saying that that has not been the case from what you've heard? And I think we would be interested in knowing where it has not worked fine. It's, it's not a question of whether it works or it doesn't work. It's, it's a math problem. There is a public education fact, uh, factor uh, associated yeah, fine. with we that. Under, we understand that. And we so, so I think from the conversations that I have had, and they have not been extensive, there is a, there is a disconnect between what the system can do and whether, whether the machines can add versus the challenges that elections administrators face, uh, you know, when it comes I'm to sorry. questions, <laughs> when it comes to questions at the poll sites, educating the poll workers and such like that. Right. So just let me, if I, I just want to be clear on this, we understand what you're saying is that the, the software and the system itself can be adjusted with enough lead time to make this work as long as you know what the ground rules are and et cetera. And your concern, just to be clear about it, your concern about it, which has not been expressed elsewhere, has, is that somehow the, the very implementation of this will create um, confusion at polling places and that voters won't understand it. Is that, or a fear of that, is that a fair statement? That's, that's part of it, but I think the major thrust of what I was, was saying earlier was if it gets implemented now, you've, you've changed the, the premise of what I was saying, so I just want to clarify. If it gets implemented now, before the change process in, conducted by the State Board of Elections is complete, what we're left with then is a bifurcated process. That was the most important point that I wanted to make. Those other things, I was I was simply uh, uh, responding to to okay. Mr. Albanese so, that there are other concerns beyond that. So, so Mr. Ryan, just let me be clear. So, if there if we approved some form of rank choice voting and provided enough lead time for it to be implemented, the the machines to be changed, the software to be adjusted. Etc. 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 That are the two current vendors that the state has approved can accommodate that as long as it's not some crazy system that none of us have ever heard of with enough lead time. Is that a fair statement? I can only speak to the vendor that we presently use, and my conversation with them is yes. Thank you, Allison. You were next. So this is actually a comment to the staff and, the, and Chair um, Benjamin. I wonder if it's possible to speak to the vendors directly as the Commission and understand how they implemented ranked choice voting in other jurisdictions and um, what kind of lead time from a technical perspective would be necessary so we could hear directly. We will certainly try. Thank you. Jim? Just, I'm sorry to clarify your clarification. <laughs> Is there a risk that the state wouldn't authorize the changes, or would they have to authorize the changes because that is how the city charter now reads that our elections are conducted? I believe that the state would accommodate, since this is a holy, uh, these elections would be holy. Uh, contained within okay. the city of New York and only affecting city offices, I can't imagine a scenario where the state would say no. What I, what I can imagine a scenario, though, is 
You have to appreciate the State Board of Elections is not a big entity. Uh, it presently has a $7 million budget. It's looking for a $10 million budget. And a lot of other changes have been thrown at the State Board of Elections recently with respect uh, to the elections process. And they have other change processes uh, ongoing presently. I have not uh, been aware of a scenario where they're able to do, uh, you know, several of those simultaneously because of uh, how cumbersome they are. I mean, th there's been a, uh, a voting system, a new, a new voting system that uh, one of the vendors is introducing, and they've submitted over four million, four million lines of code uh, to the State Board of Elections. Each one of them has to go, uh, be gone through uh, line by line to make sure that there's no uh, interference uh, in the overall operation, and that gets uh, vetted by an outside vendor to make sure it's all right. So it, it, is, it is cumbersome. Okay. I, I would ask that we reach out to the state as well. Okay. Are there any further questions of Mr. Ryan? Then I thank you, Mr. Ryan, and I'm sure we will be in touch with you. This is obviously a topic of great interest for most of the members. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I, seeing no other panels <laughs> this time, our next forum will be on Thursday, March 21st at 6 p.m. here at City Hall on several land use related topics including ULERP, comprehensive planning, and franchises and concessions. With that, the business of today's meeting has been concluded. Uh, once again, while you're more than welcome to take the written materials with you, if you could leave your little blue pamphlets so that we could reuse them, recycle them, that would be wonderful. And your name cards. Don't take them away. We want them again. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn? I so move, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? Second. Oh, I thought you wanted to discuss it. <laughs> you sure? Sal, do you want to discuss this motion? <laughs> you sure? Okay, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Oh, no, no, no. Yes, see you. James, do you know?